Welcome back to Macro Dosing, the only podcast that you can find anywhere available on the internet. It's also on YouTube, which is also the internet, but it's a different internet. It's the one with pictures. We're back in the studio. Arian's here. Mad Dog's here. Avery's here. Big T's here. Billy's here. We're ready. We're ready for a big episode today. We've got a great guest coming in in just a little bit. We're going to get in some crazy stuff with him. His name's Colin O'Brady. So if you haven't looked up what he's been up to, um, the guy is a world-renowned... Would you say he's an adventurer, Billy? This guy is probably one of the greatest modern-day adventurers. I mean, he's probably will be up there in history with like guys who like Marco Polo and stuff. Okay, like that. let's go. Like he's probably explored the hardest of our era. I don't know if he could have competed back in their era, but yeah, it's a different. He's era. putting up numbers in today's world. He is. Uh, so he's an interesting dude. We'll get to him in a little bit. Arian, how you doing? What's up? How's the move going? Your house getting getting set up? It's the state moving at a tortoise's pace, man, but I can't do the shit they do, so I'm chilling. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. gotta wait. I'm still up still upstairs. But it's looking good. Floors is done. Um kitchen's pretty much done. They got the cabinets in. That's cool. Is the TV so, in? No, the TV's not in. That's gonna be one of the last things we do. Cause it's right by the wall. I'll be busting out too. So that's that's gonna be one of the last things we do. Yeah, you gotta show us you gotta show us the TV the second it goes up. I will. I will send information. Yeah, I can't wait to see. How big is it again? 143 inches. Jesus Christ. Jesus yes. Christ. My friend Mark from Hard Factor just got a 75-inch TV. I was like, dude, that's that's too big of a TV. Yours is twice as big as his. <laughs> <laughs> it's, pretty, yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. It's, it's going to be ridiculous for sure. That's insane. So um, Imagine watching Joel Osteen on that, though, you know? <laughs> oh, it's, is it is it teeth. one screen, or do they assemble like different panels of a screen? Nah, nah, it's one screen. How are you going to get that like, through the door? I got a big door. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know they have. You, the- probably, you probably had to get a new door. You probably had to remodel your door to get your TV in. Well, the back door is like a open, like so. That's one of the things we're doing. Is we're busting out the back wall. The, the back wall is busted out, and it's I've gonna got be experience like um, in that. You should call me. <laughs> <laughs> My bad, dog. I didn't even get it done right. But we got some amateurs busting out the back wall. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, they're using lubricant. <laughs> no, but they um, uh, so they busting out the back. I don't know if you ever seen like an LA style house where like the like there's a there's a wall and it's like an open, it's like an open area from the living room and it's a glass sliding door and so that's like a really big area so they could they could they could fit through there. I don't know what they could do. They got to figure that shit out. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, good luck. Good luck. Uh, do, going through a remodel can be a pain in the ass. I know that. Um, going around the room real quick, want to check in on how everybody's weeks have been, how your weekend's been. Um, Big T, what'd you get into? Uh, nothing. Cool. That sounds like a great weekend, actually. Yeah. What, what about next weekend? Uh, Braves are here. There we go. You're resting up. Yeah. Just wanted to plug something real quick. Well, I wasn't done talking to Big T yet. We are launching a great merch line. A uh, little housekeeping. We have some amazing T-shirts with amazing taglines. That's crazy. How are you just gonna let him undercut you like that, though? That's kind of that's kind of wild. Well, I, because he's putting money in her pocket, so I'm just gonna let Billy. I'm gonna let him cook. No, I mean, okay. we got some right. awesome shirts that we currently have on right now. This one's the Macrodosian shirt, something that Arian's been trying to get us to get going, and they are awesome. They got some great taglines. We live in a simulation. Down, don't swim in Lake Lanier. In a more coming, check them out at the Barstool Store Macrodosing. Um, Space is fake is another tagline. A lot of great stuff. Hats, shirts. So be sure to check them out. Okay. Thank you, Billy. Good plug. Nice job, Billy. Great job, Billy. <laughs> nice job. Well, someone, Yo, I mean, so, so like, Billy's ad t- voice might be the weakest shit I've ever heard. I'm just, just <laughs> Billy, I, I'm okay. just trying to be good at my job. <laughs> Billy, okay. I'm going to give you some constructive criticism. Okay. okay. Yeah. Let's do it again, but do it in a Russian accent. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, go, go. We, we have some new merch dropping on the, not the black market, real market. This is above ground sales. Keep going. <laughs> so, am, I, am I fucked up? Not, are all vampires Russian? Does that, has that been? No, no, that's Transylvanian. You're, you're, mix, you're being a little, uh, you know, you're mixing up your, your ethnic groups right there. Nigga, you sound like a vampire. How I'm fucking up. No, Black <laughs> Dragula is a little, ah, uh, fuck it. Now I'm messed up. The Dragula accent's much different. 
No, it's not. I, I think Billy thinks it's called Dragula. Dracula. Like, like the Rob Zombie song. Rob Zombie? Yeah. Hey, that song yeah, fucks, you, by the way. You say it sucks? No, it fucks with an F. That what song's that good. Oh, that's that's new to me. That song fucks? Yeah. That's a term heard? that's aggressive, That, but it means good. Well, it's yeah, like, I'm trying to share my culture with you, Aaron. We're, we learn from each other on this show. <laughs> two Americas? Yeah, it's two Americas, <laughs> I, exactly. Actually... To admit, like the term "she's bad," is something that I never understood, but turns out it means <laughs> good things. You've never heard like yeah, someone being like, "That's, that's bad." I like, just remember, I just remember in high school first hearing the term, "Oh, she's a she's a baddie, she's bad." And I thought like she's like a bad person, but turns out it means she's very attractive. <laughs> were you were you like a boy in a bubble? Like what the fuck? That's I, that that's been around since like this, what I don't know. Probably like, Look, 16, I, I, yeah. I think I heard it first in middle school or high school, and I was like, like what? Why is she? And then I, I didn't want to ask because I didn't want to know. What about what about what about fat ass? That I mean, that's that's a little more obvious. But you ever heard the Michael Jackson or yeah, the Michael Jackson song "Bad"? Yeah, I thought that was like about being bad about being bad misbehaving <laughs> uh as long as we're confessing dumb dumb things here i was i think eight or nine when i first listened to Jimi hendrix and i had one of his cds and i was reading like the liner notes of it right and in the liner notes he's talking about the song manic depression that's the da 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 that song and it said yeah, I wrote this song about this cat that loves music and wants to make love to music. And for a while, I thought he was talking about like an actual cat. <laughs> like I wrote this song about a cat that's trying to fuck music. <laughs> and it made sense to me at the time. I was like, that's kind of weird, but, but it's a cool song. He's, the guitar playing is excellent on it. And then a couple years later, I realized, oh, cat means just a dude. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, it's, it's, it's actually non- or a chick, yeah. Gender, yeah. It's just like them cats. Like it actually, yeah. It's gender neutral. Yeah, it's a very welcoming term. It's inclusive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, maybe I'll have to just write a song about an actual cat. To try oh, to I saw t I saw Top Gun again uh, this weekend, and I'm okay with not knowing what they're saying on that song. The I just I love I love the melody so much that I, I don't think I want to know what he's saying. It's just I love humming it, so it's cool with me. Yeah, and then the chorus is Highway to the Danger Zone, but a lot of people think yeah. it's right I ride into the I danger went. zone. I, th I thought I it was I went to the danger zone. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Because yeah. the song rocks, right? Yeah, it fucks. Uh, yeah, there we go. I had that with uh, <laughs> the Beatles song, uh, Paperback Writer. I thought it was Take the Back Right Turn. Okay. Take the Back Right Turn. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right, let's 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 keep going around the room. Any songs that we didn't really realize what they were saying? There's a Bruce Springsteen song. Um, what's it called? The Is it 10th Avenue Breakdown? Is that oh, the yeah. name of it? Or 8th or, or 10th Avenue Freeze Out is yeah. what it's called. I thought for a long time he was just saying devil devil with the freestyle. But he's saying 10th Avenue freestyle. <laughs> I thought it was devil devil with a freestyle. Anyone else? I'm looking this up right now. Uh, oh, the song Blinded by the Light. Yeah. Where it says, uh, apparently the lyric is revved up like a deuce, another runner in the night. Yep. I thought it said... Uh, something uh, i guess rev wrapped up like a deuce but then i thought it said uh, uh and pulled a boner in the night a lot of people think that song says wrapped up like a douche yeah maybe i don't know that i thought about that part necessarily but i always thought it said boner boner in the what night. is a douche i've heard that i'm sure i could look it up but I i've always heard it but never cared enough to even care about it like but i've heard it for so like what does it do like you're a douche. It's always been so. I've felt nothing when somebody has said that before. Well, it comes from well, the French for a shower. It's true. Oh wait, no, no, no. I think it means like a, a like cleaning yourself. I think is French. Yeah, yeah, it's a shower. Yeah, it's so, a shower. Yeah, it's a shower. Uh, but uh, I'm blind. Do you want? Do you want to take this answer? I feel like this is me. Is We're about to get into some mansplaining territory. 
Wait, I can't hear Arian. What did he ask? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, no, don't worry about it. Yes. Mad Dog, cover your ears. I mean, I, I can put two and two together. With context clues? Yeah. Cover your ears. Okay. Uh, it's something that a lady uses on her part <laughs> when she, she wants to get optimum freshness. Or after she has a baby. Or after she has a baby. A, a douche is a vaginal cleansing kit? It is. Why is that a pejorative? Because, yeah, the, actually, that's a that's a great point. It actually shames men for sexual proclivity. No, it's it, Pro no, it's saying like if you That would be the opposite, though. If you're calling somebody a douchebag, you're saying like that guy is constantly in poon. And and cleaning it. And cleaning it, yeah. Yeah, it's a... It's, a it's, it's, it's slut shaming men. That, no. <laughs> it's, it's congratulating them for having good hygiene. Yeah. And then passing it along. That, that's the stupidest slur I've ever heard in my life. I agree. When you think about it, it doesn't really make sense. Hmm. We need to take back douchebag. <laughs> well, I think, well, actually, douchebag, I think, refers to... Billy, that's your word. That's that's You get to take that back. <laughs> <laughs> what up, douchebag? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but I think douchebag is like something... Not It's not even a douche. I think it's like a, a bag that that holds the... Like a, like a vacuum douche. bag. I don't think it vacuums. I think, I it think just, it's a vacuum I think bag. it just sprays. Okay, let me look up. Mad Dog says it sprays. Hmm. It's not a vacuum. You think you think chicks are out here just like vacuuming their <laughs> vaginas out? Billy. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> what? I don't know enough to even... I just don't know enough about that. I All I know is that it's it's definitely not a vacuum. Yeah, <laughs> without a doubt, not a vacuum. Um, have so, y'all ever used the enema? I have uh, not. I came very close one time. It was, uh, I think it was right after I had, I think right after I had my kidney stone and I was on pain medication. Mm -hmm. And so they give you a bunch of it in the hospital and then they give you just a couple to take home. But after like two days of taking pain medication, uh, it plugged me up for like five days. I didn't poop for like five days and I was... I was like getting, you know, you could feel it in your guts. Like this, this is bad. You're all jammed up and you can't poop. And so I go over to, uh, to the Dwayne Reed right on the corner here. And I just stood in the aisles, just like looking at the enemas and looking at the pills <laughs> that you have to put up there and just staring. And I'm like, you know what? Not yet. Give me one more day. Just give me one more day and I can make this happen. <laughs> so I just really focused, went home and pooped a little bit. Man, I was so happy when I did that. What about you? That's hilarious. Yeah, I had an animal when I was a kid, but I don't remember why. I think it was just like on some like cleansing shit. Um, yeah, I think we were just like my dad was like um, an FOI um, and they had some weird practices. And so like we would do odd shit. And I remember that for some reason. I should check with my mom before I shame him for that. <laughs> I'm going to call her real quick. I, I actually. <laughs> mom, have I ever had an enema? Uh, there's like, there's people who pay to go to, mm -hmm. I want to say India. Yeah. You heard about this? They do it here. They do it here. Um, oh shit. What's the name of it? Yeah. But there's people. Who hey Ma. Kalana, not uh. Kalanapin. Hey Ma. Huh? You're on, you're on a podcast. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> your face isn't. Uh, I had a quick question. Okay. I, I remember as a kid getting an enema. Is that an accurate memory? Yeah. Uh, Jesus. It's possible, but do you remember why? No, I I, I remember it was something to do with Dad trying to clean us or something. I don't yes, know. Maybe. Yes, he he was a firm believer in that. If you got sick, uh, it, it all stemmed from being sick on the inside. So his thought process was to cleaning you out and get rid of all the impurities and that that would then cause you to be healthier i think all of you experienced that ah well now you know why i'm pro science guys thanks mom <laughs> <laughs> i'll call you later okay, <laughs> yeah Ugh. so I, I wasn't tripping yeah all right that's good <laughs> that's good got to the bottom of that one yeah <laughs> um can somebody real quick look up what what oj tweeted because i'm getting tagged uh -oh. in it I'm getting tagged in and he's got me blocked. 
Let me check. Which is probably I, oh, all around. I'll play it. I, I think I saw that he had some takes on Deshaun Watson. Oh yeah. He oh good, my good. god. Let's it's, go. a, it's a minute forty four, and then we got Colin coming in. So okay. This, yeah. Just we'll we'll play this and I react to it. Here's just the tag. The, okay. the caption is OJ Simpson, the real OJ thirty two. You hired her. She made her decision. Respect it. Exclamation. The U.S. truly well. Let me start the day by uh, sending my condolences to the families of Bill Russell. You know, when I was a kid growing up in San Francisco, one of the first sports names that I heard, of course, Joe Lewis was the first, but it was Bill Russell playing across town, winning back-to-back -back NCAA championships for the University of San Francisco. And then he went to Boston where he won 11. Uh, <laughs> world championships and uh, in the process became the first black coach in all of American major sports. Uh, the winningest team player of all time, Bill Russell. God bless you. Uh, 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 this morning, you know, they keep talking about the, the Deshaun Watson situation. They hired two this separate federal videos. retired judge. <laughs> Uh, they obviously respect her, both sides. She, been she looked at it. She came out with a decision. Hey, man, that's it. That should be it. People are saying, why would he settle if he was innocent? Hey, look, guys, he's not going to change anybody's mind, no matter what he does. He can't change my mind. I think he probably was out of line with some of the girls, and I think some of the girls jumped on board uh, because there was a chance of making money. Uh, plus the fact that fighting it is going to cost a fortune. fortune. Uh, I'm pretty sure the legal fees of fighting it wouldn't be much different than um, than what he paid off in settling these cases. I just like to see it go away at this point. If I want to see negative and hear negative news every morning, I, I'll just watch Fox News Channel. They'll tell me what's wrong with America and everybody. <laughs> I'm just saying. Take care. Listen. Uh, did I'm just say I'm not saying I agree with the guy, <laughs> but I am saying I do need OJ Simpson to comment on anything that happens in America. Did it does? Did I know it kind of rocks? Did OJ Ow. just presume guilty over innocent? OJ looked at no. the facts. <laughs> OJ said, I "If he did it, here's probably the way that it happened." And honestly, I don't disagree with his assessment. I think there was some. If he shit going on with Deshaun, I think maybe some maybe some females jumped on trying to get paid. That makes a lot of sense. It's a rational take. It's, it has it's not. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's not it's, a rational take. I don't think that it's uh, like beyond the pale to think that it was proven, or at least it, it's it's been deemed to be believable. And um, a judge said that yes, there is enough evidence to say he sexually assaulted some of these women. That definitely mm -hmm. happened. Who knows if you have how many were there like 26 25 25 all 25 each circumstance is probably a little bit different we don't know but like he definitely did some of that shit like without a doubt he yeah. did some of that shit and mm -hmm. so uh six games for that oj by the way has still not been suspended by the nfl just putting that out there that's a great point <laughs> neither is aaron hernandez he never got suspended that's just a fact well there's no chance he ever plays in the nfl again OJ Simpson could theoretically, I mean, not play. What if the Bills wanted to sign him to like a one day contract, retire a bill, you know? <laughs> Suspended. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> Is there a curse of OJ? Is that why the Bills haven't won a Super Bowl? Mm. Hmm. We need to have the discussion, maybe. Four four appearances in a row. That's that's tough though. That mm -hmm. is tough. What's worse, losing four Super Bowls in a row or losing a Super Bowl in which you had a twenty five point lead in the second half? I think four in a four row. Four in a row. Four in a row. Yeah. I think it's pretty close, but yeah. I think three in a row it would it would go to the Falcons. Yeah. Four in a row is that's four's tough. That's it's hard a, to that's do. That's a lot. That's that's oh, five no. years of your life straight oh, up ruined. That's that's like, you know, the thing about football is like not the best team doesn't always win, right? So like if you could have a good game, some fluke shit happens and and you happen to fumble away a game, shit happens like that all the time. But to go four times in a row and not collect the dub, that's just that's oh the worst if you, thing. If you assume it's a 50-50 chance you win, which obviously it isn't, but just for the sake of the math, that would be a 94% chance you win one of the four. Because that'd be 50% chance you presuming, lose the first one. Right. But, but this was in the days of the Correct. NFC it's beast. Correct. Not, it's not. But yeah. 
fifty percent chance to lose the first one, then twenty five, then twelve, and then six. So you'd have a ninety four percent chance of winning one of them. The NFC beast really, really put it on Buffalo, with the exception of the Eagles, because it was uh, all three of them got involved, right? Cowboys, Cowboys twice, Giants, and at the time Redskins. The R words. To be fair, that run with the Cowboys was unreal. They had so many like Hall of Famers. Yeah. I didn't realize it was four. You want to know a crazy stat, though? This is wild. No, I don't. All right, then then you can mute yourself, but I'm going to tell everybody <laughs> else in this room. Uh, Tom Brady, in his 40s, has more touchdown passes than Troy Aikman did in his entire career. Whoa. Yeah, Aikman wasn't tossing them like that, but it was also a run-heavy league, too. Yeah, um, and they had a great offensive sense. line. Yeah, Troy Aikman like, was – a part of a great squad not taken away from him he was a, a solid very good quarterback mm -hmm. i don't think he's i don't think he's like a top tier quarterback though how's our TikTok doing okay we're good we got good. one hour i have it blocked because i don't like myself coming up on my own TikTok. <laughs> we, hey avery we're we recording right now uh yeah we are okay so <laughs> start start from the point where big t said how's our TikTok doing <laughs> he has it blocked what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Do you mean you no, don't like how you come across that on wasn't it? Part of the show. Because because I'm with you in that if if I hear a friend listening to part of my take or macrodosing, I tell them turn that shit off immediately. I can't stand the sound of my own voice. Yeah, I don't like like I've seen myself come up on my own TikTok feed, and I was like, I don't want this to happen ever again. So I blocked the account. I've caught. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I asked how I, it was doing. I still have an interest in it doing well. Dude, your your clip got us like a hundred thousand views. Which one? Um, the one of him saying public schools shouldn't exist. Yeah, oh, T, great. T puts asses in seats. I, <laughs> no, I have. Big cog T does put asses in seats because Big T says like asinine things like public schools shouldn't exist. That's and not asinine. You guys blew it way out of context. <laughs> no. I think you literally said public schools shouldn't. Did exist. you go? Yeah. To did you go? But to public he doesn't school? think it's. Yeah. A, <laughs> University of Tennessee is a public school. All right. We, we, I mean, we're not doing this again because oh, yeah. you guys don't. No, you're, you don't listen. On. Oh but. no, I think I think this is one of we'll your all-time worst takes. But it did put. <laughs> oh, it's a shit seat. take. It's a terrible it's take. A shit take. Arian, uh, I posted it on Instagram and Arian commented on. He's like, I missed this. What the fuck happened here? Yeah, bro. I don't. I, 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 you say that bullshit when I'm not on the pod, bro. I honestly That's didn't remember that you weren't horrible. here. But it's horrible. I mean, take. no, you you're not listening to what I said, but it's fine. I, let's, you said uh, there shouldn't be public schools. What else is there to hear? Correct. And then in the money that everyone would save in taxes, the the landscape of private education would look drastically different. Uh, That's the, silly. So no, no taxes? Well, then you have to talk about roads, freeways, police departments. Fire, well, no, fire no, no. I, I am. All that shit. I am an anarchist. The government should not exist. But that's another discussion. So <laughs> anyway, libertarians have no idea what they're talking about uh -huh. ever. Big Ever, T, Big T, give me another ass nine take that we can we can use to put some asses in some seats this week. Yeah. Uh, I don't have ass. This segment's takes. called Big T puts food in her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you'll stumble across one eventually that you don't listen to, and then <laughs> I mean, you don't actually pay attention. We no, we we time. had a long conversation about the public. Yeah, and nobody one. and nobody listened, and it's fine. No, I think. I, I mean, think there's a difference between nobody listening and people listening being like, "Wow, Big T's full of shit." It's no. definitely one of the better uses of tax dollars. Could you admit that? No, no, no. That's his whole what? point. Is no, did he, you he see the? the uh, did you see the video this week of the uh, the elementary school librarian uh, advocating for kindergarten and first graders to read a book about a transitioning child? Okay, well, let's, I did not. Let's, I did not oh see that God. clip. But let's it, again, let's he follows libs of TikTok. That's just fucking. I don't follow libs of bro. Well, then, oh, ask, go have conversations with teachers that actually teach. Yeah. Do you know any teachers? Yeah. Go do teachers that. are wonderful. They're, they're great people. Yeah. And, and I, I never said teachers are bad people. Well, that's, that's the narrative that's starting to come out. I was like, oh, every teacher wants your kid to be gay. Watch out. Don't yeah. go, don't go to school because they'll end up, they'll end up blowing their best friend. See what, see what I said when, or see what <laughs> I meant when I said you don't listen. That's, a, that's You're absolutely the, one that brought the narrative that's going trans, Talk to a teacher. Teachers are a librarian. You brought up that there's a librarian that wanted kids to read a, about a kid transition. Well, that's like, that's pervasive silly. through a lot that's of silly, school that's systems. Silly. It's not. It's not. All you do is follow libs of TikTok and think it's happening Don't everywhere. Don't follow it's libs not. of TikTok. Big T. Okay. With, without, whatever right wing publication that you got it from, this is not prevalent in our public schools. Can, if it was, we could literally point to a curriculum where that was the case. It's not the case. 
Big T, University of Tennessee literally would not exist if public schools didn't. That's your. Do you think that's like like an own like like I said no, nobody's like, listening. <laughs> no, it's listening. private education would not be the way you think of it now. We learn to listen. How, to public how school. do you, I, I had this conversation with people on there? Were, we had a, I got hella faded and I was on a Discord talking to people and there was a libertarian and libertarians are hilarious because they never think all the way through things right. So your worldview, Big T, is abolish government, right? And Except how, for to protect its people, which is a government's purpose. That you can then. What do you mean? Technically, pr the military. Pr prote protecting Correct. your people. Te right? Protecting. Sorry. Go ahead, Billy. No, technically, the military is a kind of public school. Their training, their training of soldiers is a publicly funded educational system. It's just if all of school I, was PE. And you got a gun. No, there's tons of <laughs> like I and my friend, my buddies in. I know what he's saying. It's like, and he's so like, home ec. You got to make your bed and all that <clears> shit too. <laughs> it's like electives. Being in the military is like take, going to a public school that's only electives, and you get a gun. Like technically, I think what you about, could. What about what about private property, Big T? How do you how do you establish private property in in your world? Uh, what do you mean? How do you establish private property? I don't I don't understand your question. Without publicly You're saying funded things the government that come from tax it. dollars. Yes. I mean in a world where the government doesn't exist, you just kind of set up shop. That's what I'm saying. So how how do you establish private property which is the core tenet of capitalism? I don't know. You just you you, you, you just are where house? you are. But then, what if, what if someone comes in your house and and is like, "Hey, it's my house now." Then I guess you've got a fight on your hands. So it's just That's jungle the rules. silliest shit. Just bring the USA to jungle silly. rules. Silly, it's silly. Anyway, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I kind of almost respect it. I do not. It's silly. It's exactly what Jesus would want. I tell you that. <laughs> what does that even mean? Do you want a, a society where it's the bigger stick rules and you follow a religion that is the exact opposite of that? You know what? You know what Big T's describing actually is jail. You're describing prison. <laughs> it's like, okay, even then, there's the there's, well, it's, there's it's authority. Like, it's like, okay, I I want to hang out in this part of the year. I want to play basketball. Who's going to be able to protect me so I don't get my ass kicked off the basketball court? Oh, yeah, I'll just get in this gang over here. So, so now this gang now he's my protection these are my these are my guys so i'm not movable off the court oh there's only one guy out there shooting he's not affiliated just push him off you're talking about lord of the flies slash exactly prison. what he's talking about bad book by the way you don't like it no. you, you don't like humanity because it describes it and he loves it. it he fucking loves it what do you mean he's advocating for it you think pig, it, piggy had it's it too direct... good for too long <laughs> <laughs> I need to you go back that, and read it again, but I, I didn't I enjoy it the first time I read I can't it. I can't find that movie. That shit was hilarious, man. They just go, they go, they go, they go ham. They do. They ham. absolutely do. Um, all right, Big T, what are you teed off about this week? Oh, thank you for asking. His uh, thoughts. <laughs> I watched uh, the film The Parent Trap for the first time this week, and I took some notes on it. D despite having actually thoroughly enjoyed the film upon its conclusion. I love how you keep calling it a film. Uh, a it is a film. It's so good. <laughs> I have, I have some cinema. thoughts. So I, I, I liked the movie a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the kids are abject morons. They get to this little camp. They, they fence. They do their little fencing thing. And then upon taking off their fencing masks, whatever those are called, you're fucking identical. You're pl played by the same person. That's how identical you are. Yep. And it, it doesn't occur to them for a while that like, you know, there might be something here. Like, I mean, you, you're identical twins. Mm -hmm. uh, so that pissed me off then. So eventually they're like, my birthday's October 22nd. So then they, they go back and they, they pull off their little switch and whichever one wasn't Dennis Quaid's kid goes with Dennis Quaid. And he notices immediately. He's like, She's using the word proper, or she's saying proper things. She keeps calling him dad incessantly, like things that the other one didn't do. And it doesn't click to him either. That made me upset. Uh, but then eventually I'll, wh whatever. Now, my overarching uh, concern was this custody agreement, wherein uh, the two children were just never to know of the other's existence in each 
it was literally the split the baby. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they just, uh, I'm going to take one kid, you take the other. Yeah, that doesn't happen. Mary shall the two meet. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that makes, uh, that's not legal. That. Excuse that's me, not I'll a thing. I'll tell you what, if I was one of those two parents, I would not be bringing my child anywhere where it was even a remote possibility that they would run into the other child. Oh, it's been my entire life trying to avoid that exact circumstance from happening to have them figure out what's going on. Do you think that this was bad for, for kids that grew up um, with uh, divorced parents because it gave them hope like, hey, if you try hard enough, you can get your parents back together? I'm sure there was some of that. Yeah. But <laughs> but the original one had been out, what, 30 years before that. That's true. All right. So how many how many balls do you give the movie? It was a good it was a good move that. That blonde bitch sure was a cunt too. Um, Big T. Uh, what? Don't say the c word. Why? Because. Uh, I don't know. It was like a. It was like a three nine. It was a good movie. Three nine out of five. Yeah. Okay. Out of five balls. Got it. God. She really pissed me off. Okay. Big, Big T's one sentence review of the Parent Trap on a quote card because we're spreading it around, Arian. No, no, no. Because you've never actually made a quote card of Arian. Yeah. yeah, we yes, have. I have. Not the of time. the not of the shit that we say we're gonna put on it. Yeah, I yeah, do. we have all the time. Did. Where he's like talking shit about his teammates. Like, yeah, like I might I have did the only quote cards on his podcast. Did yeah. you block the the Mac? Yeah, did you block all of my social media? No, it's just muted. <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm on the show. I don't need to see the clips. I was there. <laughs> Common Fair. big T W. <laughs> Fair, I guess. I don't know. I all right, that blonde this. that blonde bitch sure was a cunt. Big T. Okay. Put, that on, put that on the shirt. <laughs> this review of the parent trap. <laughs> uh. Uh. The, to, to be clear, the, the the girl that he's gonna get engaged to, or that he is engaged to, right. before mm -hmm. he uh, reunites with. Yeah, that's wife. that's what she was supposed to be. She's supposed to be. I'm, I'm aware. Yeah, but she she played it well. And that's my exact reaction after I'm done watching Casino with Sharon Stone. But also, great great character that she played. Also, why is Big T allowed to say the C word? But when I said the F, F word on my first episode, his mom called me about it. She's used to Which it. Which F word? Now. Fuck. Okay. Ew. Oh. That but seems he can nah. say the C word? Yeah. Mrs. T. Well, I believe her, her complaint was women cussing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was that you were a lady. She's very sexist, uh, it sounds like. <laughs> but the C word is a harsh word no matter whose mouth it comes out of. Agreed. Yeah. Which oh, is actually, uh, in English, yeah, in no. English, they can get away with it. Yeah, Australians too. They say it every other word. Tennessee. So I know, but the English get away with that. I don't know how. No. It's I don't know how. It. It's it's like their word. <laughs> right. Yeah. When they when they say twat too. Yeah. You bloody twat. That's just as bad. Yeah. Oh, uh, wanker. Wanker is a good one. I've been watching a lot of um, uh, Love Island UK. <laughs> yeah. It's it's actually the best season I've seen this 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 season new season. I don't know if anybody's up oh, on it, but it's the Blanche best. Bombshell has entered the Yeah. Video. But these things, oh, so bombshell over there doesn't mean what it means over here. Bombshell here means like you were, you know what I'm saying, you're a baddie. Bombshell there means it's an unexpected surprise with like a negative connotation. Oh. Well, they live through the blitz. It's true. True. <laughs> That's true. They also say, um, what do they say? Uh, boner means a mistake. I made a boner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, made, one, like, you screwed up. Like, when, like when you got to put in work to, like, you know, what I'm saying, you got to work on, like, getting in somebody's good, good graces. They call it grafting or graft. They say grafting. I got to do a lot of grafting here. They, like, they, say, <laughs> they, say, <laughs> they say that. There's another one that's funny as shit too. What? Um, saying, this, this bird's well fit in it. Saying, yeah, fit. Saying fits she, like yo, yeah. she bad. She proper she, fit. Saying, yeah, uh, she proper fit. <laughs> saying what is super offensive. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, you have to say pardon or excuse me. Saying what outright is like what? Like it's it's offensive. <laughs> do you guys say do what? Some people say instead of saying just what on their own, they'll be like, do what? It's a regional thing. I know a few people that do that. I do I say what. I know I heard say what. Say, say what, what? I've heard that too. Do what always it really throws me for a loop. Um anyways, oh. you guys are sleeping on on uh, Love Island, Britain, not me. I sleep on a Helix. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress. You like that, Aaron? 
That shit was nice. Though. Helix, you get a mattress that you know is going to be perfect for the way that you sleep. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. They have soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattresses that are great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Mattresses that are great for spinal alignment to prevent morning aches and pains. And even a Helix Plus mattress for plus size sleepers. I took the Helix quiz. I got matched with the Helix Midnight Luxe mattress. I needed something that was medium firm. They delivered. It's fantastic. I wake up every morning feeling fresh, no back pain anymore. If you're looking for a mattress, you take the quiz. You order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door shipped for free. You don't ever need to go to a mattress store again. Just go to helixsleep.com slash dose. Take their two-minute sleep quiz. They're going to match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your entire life. That's a fact. Helix is offering up to 200 bucks off all their mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash dose. Helixsleep.com slash dose. Mount Hel- Everest. Helix is sick, by the way. It Sorry. Is. Didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's fine. But plug, it's so good. Plug away. I have a Helix mattress. It's the best mattress I've ever owned. I also have a Helix mattress. Fire. Fire mattress. I want this another bed one. right here behind me is a Helix mattress. Uh, what up with another one, though? I got a new house. Uh, Avery, see if you can holler at him for I, me. I, <laughs> Billy, Billy texted me this weekend. It was like, Avery, I need a mattress. What's You're upgrading, up, Billy. I mean, I'm not upgrading. You got somebody moving in. <laughs> Mincy's moving into your apartment. Oh, shit. Don't put no dog on your mattress, bro. It's just gross. No, Mincy is not a dog. He's my... <laughs> <laughs> You've met Mincy. No, no, sorry. He is a dog. No, he is a dog. He's got that dog. He's got, he's got, got that dog, dog in him. Yeah. Yeah. He's out there. He's on a widespread panic show. He's come back I'm, from fish in Maryland. I, I, I know who Mincy was. It's a funny joke, but I was just saying, don't put the dog on the mattress, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, you're so weird. He was talking about my dog. Um, who sleeps on the mattress because he is, he deserves to. He's a king. And he wakes Matthews. up with no back problems. No back problems. Guys, I think I got a concussion this morning. What'd you do? What happened? Um, I was okay, so I work out every day before I come to work. I was running late this morning on my way to class and I tripped across the crosswalk. Oh no. Look at my arms. Oh my elbows. Oh shit. Did you fall on your head? Oh my like I like hit my neck and I like like no no arms were involved in breaking my fall. Like, so where was did you face. did you road rash on your face? No, it was like at the side of my neck. Do you, are you having deja vu? No, but I'm really tired all of a sudden. <clears throat> yeah, your eyes started to droop. I oh, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Someone get put a flashlight in your eyes. But it's so what embarrassing. What day is it today? It's Monday. But it's okay. so embarrassing. Okay, free what online happened? concussion test. Mad Dog might have gotten a do you, concussion. Do you have a morning. baseline? Do you have a baseline? Do you have, ever take the impact Mad Dog test? CT? No, I never. Question mark. Mad Dog has CT. No, Arian, I tripped across the crosswalk this morning working out, and it was, and so now I'm all scratched up. And also, it was raining, so I was, then I was all wet. It was so okay, so Mad Dog, rate rate yeah. your headaches scale of zero to six. Right now, yeah. Have you had any headaches? Today? Like a one. One. Okay, it's a one. Okay, ne- you, wait. I can, hang on, I Billy. Wait. Wait. Neck pain. Like a four or five. Is it? Would you describe it as moderate or severe? Mm-hmm. Okay, moderate. I'm not like dying. Four. Nausea? No. Zero. Dizziness? No. Zero? Zero. Maybe I didn't get a concussion. Blurred vision? No. Zero. Okay, maybe I didn't get a concussion. Maybe I'm Balance? Uh, yeah. I don't think so. I want to be honest. Concussions oh. have gotten so overdiagnosed, especially at like the high school sports level. Sensitivity to light? Actually, when I got back to my apartment, I was like a two. I'll give it a two. Well, what happened? I just was like, what the fuck? Like, I was like thrown off. You're like, it's so bright in here? Yeah. I'm going to give that a three then. Okay. Like, you noticed it. I noticed okay. it. Okay. Noise? You sensitive to noise? No. Okay. You feeling slowed down? Yes. Okay. Five or six? I'll do five. You in a fog? Mm, this morning I was. Did you drink last night? No, I did not. Don't feel right. Scale of zero to six. Like three. Difficulty concentrating? This morning more, it was like a three or a four. Okay. Like I just sat there. I couldn't, I couldn't like get dressed after I started. What about remembering? You're remembering things? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Fatigue? Yes. Five or six? Five. Confusion? 
Mm, I don't think so. Maybe it's one. Drowsiness? Yes. A lot of these questions are the same. Yeah. These are all like, are you tired? Trouble falling asleep? We don't know. Don't know. Are you more emotional? I, uh, yeah, because I got I, I got mad this morning. Yeah. Okay. I got mad at Jake Malisek this morning. Okay, there's that's, a lot more that questions. Be, that's also normal. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that you um you might have a concussion. You might not. Okay, I, that's fine. <laughs> now, d- I mean, did we hear the borderline pro brain injury I just, take that I was just, spliced in I there? I just kept that moving. Oh, what the? <laughs> no, some there's ridiculous stories where like someone gets hit, like hit in the head with like a soccer ball and they're like, oh, I'm concussed. You can't, I mean, like, you they, can't get a concussion. And they overdiagnose them and then like it. Like, Isn't it one of those things where you'd rather be like overly it, safe? Yes, no, I was about to say. Like, yeah. That's one of those know, things where it's like that's okay to over over diagnose in high school. Because Bill, you, what you're going to you're going to understand as well, you get a little football. bit as you get a little bit older that um, the brain is something that you don't want to fuck up. And I know, so I know that you might feel like, oh yeah, I'm going to be you're a pussy if you don't like. I'm try not to being play a hardo this. about it, but like literally, like sometimes you. It's, honestly, I think it might have been my specific experience, but you just see people like get this was more of like someone get hit in the head and they milk it, leave school, not do homework, be out for weeks. But like you knew that it was just BS. So I, I'm calling I'm calling cab on it. That it's it's something you probably well, never saw. My was, my was out for weeks. You could if you had a head. concussion, you could really milk it and take advantage of like especially yeah. in the Carl cab on your story. But yes, you should. Absolutely. No, no, but it wasn't it's like it wasn't anyone. Injury, bro. So, like you look, I look back on the different sports I played, the different injuries I played, and at the time I was like, okay, whatever, it's just I'm seeing stars, no big deal. And then you think back on it once you get a little bit older, and you're like, yeah, that was I, I should not have kept doing that. No, I should have stopped. So you gain a, a little bit of perspective as you get older, and you look back on it, and you realize that it's not the most important thing in the world to finish the fourth quarter of a high school football game. No, no I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. As someone who like. <laughs> understands what concussions was and someone who probably got a bunch and realizes now like okay that was there was times where it, it, I, it was definitely overdiagnosed. so what i was surprised to hear because i actually i did have a chance to talk to um his name's chris nowinski he's one of the guys that's uh leading up the is it boston university study it's the one that where they collect the brains and they do the cte studies i'm actually going at the end of august to get my, my cat scan oh cool yeah, let us know and how that works yeah, out. They, they, you know, study. Yeah, that would so be fun. They're doing um, they're doing really important work up there. I got a chance to talk to him. This is like I don't know, seven, eight years ago, I think. And he was talking about um, the subconcussive blows that you get and and what the difference is. And it's really just a spectrum. So there's no real way of being like, okay, this is a concussion, and this is what's different from having a co- concussion as opposed to having like a minor brain bruise. Um, it's just varying degrees of it, you know, like right. where you say the line is drawn varies, um, depending on what doctor you're talking to. And it's just like a, a way to label it. But he was saying that when you, when you sneeze or not when you sneeze, um, anytime that you're, that you see stars after like a hit, which I've seen stars numerous times, um, that is a brain injury that you have. And it's a, a very specific, uh, reaction that your body has where you do see those stars and those like blinking lights. And um, that is on it's on the spectrum of a concussion. I'm like, well, shit like that happened to me. Yeah. Like that, I, I can't even count how many times it happened. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there's like I totally believe that subconcussive blows. I totally understand. And even those new guardian hats, I think I wish we wore those sometimes, especially in Pop Warner in practice when we like we did so much more hitting drills in because that was before the period of the no contact practices. That was more something that came in high school for my generation. But in youth, we definitely did way too many hitting drills because we did like once a week and it was just all hitting all that one practice. And then there was other. Um, but uh, with that, there was definitely times where the system uh, and it wasn't in football. It was more in other sports. Like sometimes people would get hit with a tennis ball. I mean, it was just what I'm saying is not every hit to the head is a concussion that needs to be treated. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. More mm-hmm. than anything, my ego was bruised. A lot of people saw yeah. me fall. Yeah. And it was raining and I got all wet. So where was this? Um, It was across a canal street, like a very busy street in New Is, York. Are there any stores that have um, security cameras outside where we can find no. the footage? Luckily, I was um, I was in like the I was just crossing over like into Tribeca. So I was, it was like the corner of like canal and the West Side Highway. Like it was Oy. a packed 
the intersection. Yeah, that's that's pretty busy. I know. And it was like during rush hour and I just had to get up and I was running late. So I had to like get up. I couldn't even, I was like in shock. I had to get up and run and then covered in like blood and rain. And I just Did anybody talk in. to you? Did anybody check on you? No, because there was no one outside of their car. It was just people like in their cars. And then one construction worker, and he just kind of like smirked at me, and I was like, I don't want to. I was going to check on you, but then I, I was like, I was nervous and just walked away. If I was that's, a what, we, that's what we do on our commutes yeah. and into work here on yeah, this podcast. Right. Yeah, no, but construction workers aren't saying anything to women nowadays. At Thank no cost. You know what? Yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah. the price of the Me Too <laughs> yeah. movement, guys. Yeah. Is that women are out here getting concussions <laughs> left and right, left to die in the yeah. rain, <laughs> and and guys are afraid to see if they're okay because they they might get canceled. <laughs> Right. From their insulation job. No. On the job. No, but th- that happens. If you were like, yeah, are you okay? Up, I wouldn't have taken that as a cat call. I was like, <laughs> I was like covered in blood and rain. Okay, Leave so- me alone, you fucking pervert. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was actually like. I wouldn't have taken it like that at that point. Let's let's talk about the, the phenomenon of cat calling real quick. Because I never really understood it. Okay. Like, let's just say I'm working outside at a job. And a girl walks by. And I just like whistle at her. And then she just looks at Am I expecting like her to be like, yo, what's up, man? Thank you for thank you for whistling. You wanna fuck? Like what's what's the outcome? Why why do you guys do that? Well get their rocks off. They're insane, is yeah. what it is. It's yeah. weird, they're isn't like, it? It's like a no, they like, their 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 brain, their social norms is just some something ain't connecting upstairs. Like it's the wackest and usually I think when you're in a group of dudes to show like, dominance. It's, it's, like, it's like a pack. When you're in a pack of fellas, mm-hmm. that's when I seen it happen the most. I never, I never really seen dudes solo. Like, I, I mean, I, I guess there's probably instances where it has happened, but mostly it's just, it's just, dis- I, it's, I, I loathe it. I think I told the story one time before on this podcast, but like, I never did it because I was like eight years old and I was walking with my mom and we was at a bus stop, and like some dudes was like cat calling her, and like they was big, they was bigger than me. And thinking back now, there's probably like five, six. But like it was bigger than me, and I was scared of shit. And my mom was scared. You know what I'm saying? It's like, and so ever since I never did it, though. It's just corny shit in the world, bro. Just go holler at it. Bro. I I actually saw it very recently, uh, last week in Italy. It's a it's a big thing to go ciao bella. That's all the Italian men they'll say ciao bella to women. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just like, are you? Is it Italian or perverted? <laughs> like but, it's it's sometimes very cultural. It's cultural in Italy, yeah. Yeah, ciao in, bella. In America, though, it's just gross. It's so weird. Oh, so it's okay in Italy? No, no. but I haven't been to Italy to, 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 to test it. It sounds better. Ciao bella. Ciao bella. Ciao bella. Yeah. It's way more welcoming than, hey. Everything so sounds bitch. better in Italian. Everything yeah. sounds better. Italian. Like, damn, bitch. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they always there's say a, bitch. It's like, well, shut up. Also, there's there's another thing which is really creepy that I, I witnessed where there's like this hissing noise that sometimes happens. Have you guys ever? I would not love to be hissed at. It's like, I've never heard that. That yeah. is. Nah, what is that? Is that no? Okay, so I, one time I was working on a job site. Did you hiss? I did not hiss, but I people were trying to teach me how to hiss <laughs> because it would be very. It was They're like if you really want to get laid, you can't be. You can't be just hollering at him. <laughs> no, you basically, make it sound like a snake. They love that. I'm. I'm actually. Not or do dolphin this. clicks? They really. They really <laughs> like that. <laughs> just I'm actually SpongeBob? not gonna tell this story because it's definitely it's definitely yeah, it's too time, problematic. Making sounds like a pervert already. No, because like, it's, it. I, I'll t- this now. You know, I'm just gonna walk back this story. Perfect. All right. If you want to have a fun time with a child, this is totally unrelated. You tell them. <laughs> anyway, hey, yo, guess, you stop. Guess, guess what? And no, it has nothing to do with that. I say, guess <laughs> what? And I do this with kids all the time. I do this with kids all the time. I say, guess what? Animal. Uh, the sound is, and you just do this, like you go, go ah, ah, and you do, is it a sheep or a dolphin? And then whatever they guess, just say it's the opposite and they'll keep coming back. It's Arian, the funniest shit. You did this with what? me and Billy like a month ago. Oh, fuck was I drunk. <laughs> <laughs> when we were on that Instagram live after we went to the oh Yankees game, you literally did that with me and Billy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do that to kids all the time, though. <laughs> My bad. And they get to a fight over fun. whether it's a, a dolphin or not. Yeah, they, like they just keep coming back, and then like if there's more kids, they're like, "I'm next, I'm next, I'm gonna get it." It's the funnest shit in the world. Yeah, I like well, that. You just did that to two twenty-three year olds, and and <laughs> did it work? Did y'all guess? Yeah. <laughs> and then you said, "No, it's the other one." Yeah. <laughs> we were like, "What? <laughs> no, 
No way. Um, so Mount Everest. <laughs> Let's talk about Everest. The big one. Mount 29029. Everest. So Mount Everest may be the highest altitude above mean sea level, but it is not technically the largest mountain from base to peak. Okay, I got you. So it's the highest point in the world. Right. But it's well, not if you just look at the mountain itself. It's the highest point in the world from sea level, but is not technically the farthest point on earth from the center of the earth. Yeah, this is this is fascinating to me. Okay. So Mount Everest from the mean sea level is 29,029 feet. Actually, and that is debated because Everest every year grows four millimeters because of tectonic shape, uh, tectonic plate movement. Okay, so it's still getting bigger. Yeah. But there's two other mountains, Mount Chimborazo, which is actually the farthest from the center of the earth because it exists on the equator, which because of central, okay, central fugal forces. Did I say that right? Centri centrifugal. Centrifugal. Cent centrifugal. That's a hard one. Because there's also a centripetal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a hard That's a hard one. Give me a break there. But the I'm earth not, I'm is- I'm not even going to try. I don't- The earth is not shaped like a perfect spear. Uh, sphere. It's shaped like from the side and almost looks like a it oval. Bulges a little bit. It bulges at the equators, and because of that, Mount Chimborazo is the farthest point on Earth from the center. Nice of the uses of farther versus further. I like it. Mm -hmm. And then there is Ma this one's in Hawaii, uh, Mount Kia in Ma Moana Kia is. 33,500 feet from top to uh, top to bottom, but the bottom is underwater. Right. And it's a, a dormant volcano. Okay. But for our defini definition of tallest mountain, Mount Everest is definitely the biggest because it is also higher than both of those from the surface of the earth sea level. Um, but it, that's just fascinating that there are other mountains that are technically could be argued to be taller than Mount Everest. Okay, but but Mount Everest is still the highest up that you get. The highest point, tech, yeah. Highest point. Yeah. It has the it in this is mentioned. It has the highest atmospheric uh, lack of oxygen, altitude, thinnest air. So mm -hmm. it does beat out the other two in that area. So for perspective, if you're flying on a plane, if you're going like cross country. You're probably at about 33,000 feet, I would guess, mm -hmm. for most of your cruising altitude. Yep. So looking down, that's how tall Mount Everest. You would fly into the top of Mount Everest. Yeah. Also, you can't fly helicopters as high as Mount Everest because the air is too thin. Yep. So that was also fascinating. I was actually, last night, I was in an F-16 Eagle, and I was just cruising around about 45,000 feet. And I was looking down, and I was like, damn, this thing... I'm really far high up. Right Did now. you check out Mount Everest? Well, I was traveling at about Mach 1.9, so I was really calling ass at the moment. So, um, no, I was in I was in Syria. I think I was. That's pretty close to Mount Everest. I should just go to. Well, not really, but I. Well, I, how how long would it take you to get to Mount Everest from Syria? If you're going two times the speed of sound, yeah. My guess would be a couple hours. Like probably only three, three or four hours, maybe. Yeah, that's not that. Like you have time. I do have time. Yeah. Um, but Mount Everest is located between Nepal and Tibet. I'm going to say Tibet. Uh, those are the two countries that um, border Mount Everest. Each of the, bo the border is actually the top Mount Everest. The north side is Tibet, Tibetanese, and the south side is Nepalese. Mm -hmm. And those two um, countries were the ones that uh, inhabited that region. They have very... Uh, the people there are actually extremely unique in that they, in the Sherpas, uh, are examples of this. They have extremely high tolerance to the altitude. So there's been studies that their genetics causes them to be uh, better able to breathe in that altitude, higher red blood cell counts, um, to supply oxygen to their body, and that is why they're the best guides up Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. So very interesting group of people. They have a huge religious. A connotation to Mount Everest. They think it is the home of the gods. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're very angry about the state of Mount Everest, which we'll get to into later. Yeah. The the guest that we have coming up, Colin O'Brady, he, uh, he's summited Everest a couple of times. He's been on all the highest peaks in the world. 
and he's got some insight because he's seen like firsthand what the state of the mountain is. But I, I really got into Mount Everest back in like, I want to say 2011 when I read Into Thin Air, which yeah. you should read. Everybody should read it if you're into like nonfiction books. It's fascinating. It's about a doomed expedition that went up Everest um, because Mount Everest had become, uh, what's the word for it? Like commercialized. Yeah. Almost where there were, there were guide companies that were springing up where they're like, hey, as long as you're in decent shape and you get to Mount Everest, if you get to base camp, we can, if you pay us enough money, we can make sure that you get to the top of it. And it, beca- it became so commercialized for a while. And there were way too many people on the mountain that had no business being there. And when you're up at that type of elevation, your body starts to die and your brain suffers from lack of oxygen. You go into hypoxia, which means that you start hallucinating. You start getting lost, confused. It's actually pretty similar to having a severe concussion. And you just do things that don't make sense. You take off your mask. You take off your gloves. You go walking just off the side of a mountain because sometimes it's whiteout conditions and you just you wander off. It sounds terrifying. And there was a, a gigantic disaster that happened up there where many people lost their lives. And the book uh, is a really, really interesting chronicling of that. So go check that out if you haven't read it yet. But since then, they've tried to cut back on that a little bit because that was a major wake up call. But we've all seen that picture at the top of Mount Everest where there's a giant line where people like have to wait to get up to the summit. And the summiting times are just so precise that if you wait an hour too late or you go an hour too early, you get caught in a storm, you're pretty much dead at the summit. Mm, you So there's a two o'clock rule that you have to summit by two o'clock. Uh, so a lot of people who are still walking up and they're, you know, 10, even 10 meters away from the summit at like 150, they have to turn around because if they get there too late and you let's say they summit at 215, it's more than likely that on their way down, they're going to hit darkness. They're going to hit storms that come in with the lowering temperatures at night. And it's a very, it's, you know, even though it is visited and it only has a 1% death rate nowadays because <laughs> over, you know, 9,000 people have some, there's some extreme amount only about, uh, since in modern times, only about 300 have died. Um, but all 300 of those bodies are still on the mountain. Yeah, I'm doing the math in my head right now. I think that's three. the average death rate is about one percent. I know that the math is it harder to get into Hamburg University than it is to die on Mount Everest? Hamburg, <laughs> yeah, that's the big question. <laughs> but yeah, but Mount Everest was uh, it created? It was created when the subcontinent of India, which is now India, actually hit Asia. And what happened is you had two tectonic plates hitting, causing the mountains to spring up mm-hmm. from uh, between those because they had no, all that rock had nowhere to go when those two plates hit, causing the Himalayan mountain range, mm-hmm. which is you know the largest mountains in the world, and they separate uh, India and China with two uh, with Nepal and uh, Tibet in between. Tibet is now technically part of China, uh, but it was once an independent country. So. Um- if you look back on the history of mountains, when you think of like the Appalachian Mountains in the United States, they're pretty. People just know like, oh, these are some gorgeous mountains. They look nice. Um, they actually used to be the tallest mountain range of the world way back in the day. But because of shifting tectonic plates, they got smaller. They got flattened out through erosion, also through uh, the continents drifting. Um, but at one point, they were taller than the Himalayas. They were the tallest mountain range in the entire world. Also, do you know that there's the same string of mountains as the Appalachian Mountains? There's part of it in Scotland. They are originally together, but because of tectonic plates, they're now separated. I did not know that. Like Pangea? Yeah. Yeah, Pangea. Mm. I'll trip you out. Um, Mount Everest is named after the Surveyor General of India, George Everest. Uh, the Nepalese name That's is... That's a good Nepali. classic Indian name. Nep- well, George yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I f- he was once appointed there. Colonialism. Uh, the Nepali name is Sagamartha. That's Sagarmatha. A, that's a way cooler name. Meaning the head of great blue sky. Likewise, the Tibetan name is Chomo Lungpa, meaning holy mother. Both cooler names. Yeah. Mount Everest. I don't think like I'm not trying to like tear down George Everest statue because it sounds like you know he did a great job of walking up to it and be like. That mountain right there is very tall. Also crazy. Very tall indeed. <laughs> crazy. That and so they, they named the whole fucking thing after him. But just objectively speaking, 
Sagar Martha. And what, what was the other one? Chomo Lungpa. Chomo Lungpa. Those are cooler names. Just like when they changed when they changed Denali from McKinley to Denali. Denali is a way cooler name. I think even Sarah Palin was like, "Yeah, we call it Denali up here." Wait, is Mount McKinley not called that anymore? Oh, sorry, happen? not not McKinley. Um, my mis- well, Yeah, maybe it was. Mc- wait, wait. Denali. That Mount McKinley is the one in Alaska. Yeah, it's called Denali now. When did that happen? It happened uh, Obama. <laughs> no, that makes sense. <laughs> Thanks, Obama. <laughs> Obama did it, but isn't Denali cooler? That's the name of the like nat the national park that's up there. Naming dispute. The name of Mount McKinley was subject to local criticism. Yeah, it was. It was the locals that wanted to change it. Like yeah. Alaskans wanted to change it. Because McKinley, like, what did McKinley do as president? He got shot. Mm-hmm. He got shot. He had AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> You guys heard that one, right? Uh, I guess. Yeah. I guess it's good that I know now. I, didn't I don't know think we changed that's a. It. I don't think that's a common when. I don't think that's a common outside of our circles that audio clip. It might not be. So <laughs> what, yeah, sir. What is it? It's uh, uh, the former Clippers owner who was just going off. Donald on Sterling. Oh yeah. no, no, I remember that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking about black folk. Yeah. Um, an average Everest climber needs 35 hours of bottled oxygen. That was one of the big reasons why summiting Everest became much easier than it originally was because bottled oxygen and uh, oxygen tanks became uh, the technology was updated and they're being mass produced. So audio books. Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to I want to fact check myself because I don't want to I don't want to smear Sarah Palin's good name. She, in fact, was not in favor of the name change. I was about to say that didn't sound right. Yeah, no, I didn't. She said, no, but the Middle East is a tinderbox. Our economy still su- our economy still sucks. So many things are going wrong right now that are under his purview. And yet he would kind of make it a big darn deal to come up here and rename a mountain. That's a lot of the criticism. So that's what she said. Uh, then Lisa Murkowski, who's a Republican senator from Alaska, said that she has long advocated for Denali to officially be called Denali, and she thanked President Obama for the decision. So I think I, I remember reading at the time that there's uh, there was a majority of people that lived in Alaska that wanted it to be renamed as Denali. But um, Everest, I guess, is still called Everest for now. I might call it Sagarmatha, though, because that's way sweeter. I thought Everest was like because everest is a maybe it's just because it's been so embedded in uh you know our lexicon in that it we think everest means tall just by word association but ever rest i always thought like it was some latin equivalent word that meant like ever high or something or like never <laughs> rest the most ever like yeah. the everest yeah exactly like not a name when i found i just yeah. found out it was a name and i was like yeah like the the Everest, like the mostest. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually don't think that Everest is a bad name for it. I think that it's a it's a fine name, but just when you put it up against the competition, I, I don't think it's really a contest. Yeah. So um, the, isn't that what we're about as Americans? Good old fashioned competition. It is. <laughs> leave, it, leave it. Leave it to the polls. Um. Yeah. So uh, Everest has become because there's been so many people summoning it, and because it is so cold. Uh, there's a lot of trash, yellow snow, and feces on the mountain because when you're climbing it, you can't carry your poop with you. And because of that, uh, a lot of mountain climbers have been leaving droppings on the mountain. It is now uh, new legislation that you have to bring your poop with you um, or pick it up on the way back down. But How's that being enforced? Well, I think the Sherpas... Who the who guide it are now like yeah this is a problem. So there's got to be mountain law, right? Once you reach a certain point where there's no law enforcement up there, there have to be different rules, right? It's like take care of yourself. The rules for for all sorts of stuff up there, I'm sure, are different. There's a lot of gray area once you're in the death zone. If I was risking my life to climb this mountain, I would not be concerned with what was happening with my shit. Just me. Yeah. Exactly. Like who's what are they gonna write you a ticket? Yeah, go for it, pal. Yeah, good luck in it. finding well, finding. Is it repairs. that it's is it that it's so cold it's not biodegradable? Yeah, I mean it's frozen. If you if you take shit and put it in your freezer, it's nothing's really happening to it. I need to try. <laughs> Fair I, I can't argue with that. <laughs> I mean, nah, they, I'm gonna trust. I'm, I'm gonna trust the science on that. Okay, one. <laughs> yeah, new science fair project for next year. <laughs> <laughs> is shit biodegradable? <laughs> what what is that? 
I'm going to freeze a piece of my shit for a year. What's that Alaskan? <laughs> you know, that, that'd be awesome if a kid did that for their science fair project in elementary school. Because objectively, you could learn something scientific. You could It would be a very educational thing. But like have a big white bit board set up and it's like, okay, here in this jar is my piece of shit. I kept what, frozen. What is that urban dictionary term that involves putting shit in your freezer? Uh, I don't know. Oh my God. This used to be one of the ones where we first discovered urban dictionary. It was like, I think it's like an Alaskan bullworm. No, no it's not. That's the SpongeBob thing, but it's, it's something ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I guess maybe avalanches and wind blowing might affect the poop. Um, but I don't think anything else is happening to okay, it. Okay, let's see here. Let's take a cruise down. I think it involves a condom. And All right, so there's one called the Alaskan Pipeline. The act of that's it. The act of pooping into a condom, yep. freezing it overnight, and then inserting it into one's anus. Billy left that part out of. Yeah, that is conveniently left out. What the fuck, dog. No. Uh, okay, let's see. Space docking. <laughs> this involves two people. One person takes a big long poop and wraps it in plastic wrap. Then you put it in the freezer when frozen, take out and insert into the other's anus. It's we're called space docking. We're talking. children of the internet. And when uh, Urban Dictionary was discovered- Wait, I'm not done yet. We the Alaskan Pipeline. Uh, no, that's, that's the one in your butthole. I did discuss that one. The other one is, oh, there's a variation of the Alaskan Pipeline. When a guy takes a shit, puts it in the freezer, and then the girl uses it as a dildo. We got to okay, stop we can this. move. Yeah, we, we can move stop. on. Okay. I, I guess I, I'm the only one who's on Urban Dictionary. Igloos. No, shit, yeah, we're, let's go. Looking, looking to shit that, into yeah. An, yeah. Ice clean, an ice cream tub. I thought this would be more stop. of a shared experience. Uh, turns out it isn't. Sorry. Um, Just you, Bill. Yeah. Just you, Bill. Um, the first European to sub in Everest was... Did you do any of those things? No, it was more... No, it was like... It was like just one of those internet things you found. They were like, oh, it's funny. Um, gotcha. Sir, I don't think anyone's ever done that. Uh, Sir Edmund know, Hillary um, summited... Has anybody ever jacked off on top of Mount Everest? Well, if you take your dick out, it gets frostbite. <laughs> it freezes right off. Yeah, there's got to be a way, though. I mean, under... That must be the best feeling ever, because it's kind of like you're getting choked out, fire. right? <laughs> <laughs> you take your, no, you're getting you're getting choked out through the lack of oxygen. Imagine asphyxiation. Yeah. Imagine if you're a Sherpa and you're like guiding this guy. <laughs> he's just like that's the next done it level. A thousand times, and then the guy just gets to the top. He's like, "Yeah, we're here. You want a picture?" I want to just goes no. <laughs> I want to do the seven summits, but we're a jack off on top of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> what am I talking about? Where are we? <laughs> uh, I lost my place. I got distracted. <laughs> it's okay. Picture in PFT, rub one out and fucked you up, bro. <laughs> oh no! Just like the idea of like some like Sherpa is like taking someone up the mountain. And he's like, oh, this is another regular, you know, Everest summiting. And you're like, oh, we'll take a picture and go back down. The guy's like, no, I gotta do this. It's got to be one of the scariest places, though, when you're up on the mountain and and. You're suffering from all that hypoxia and even the most clear headed people aren't thinking totally clearly. Death is all around you. I, I just, I never understood the drive of anybody to want to climb it. I, it doesn't really appeal to me that much. So uh, Sir Edmund Hillary summited Mount Everest with a Sherpa named Tenzing Norgay. Um, He's the goat, by the way. The goat. And honestly, Norgay definitely deserves way more props than Hillary. Like yeah. hundred percent. I mean. So Norgay took him all the way to the top and then let him go first. Yeah. And should we say, do we know, was Sir Edmund Hillary the first person to summit or was he the first person that talked about summiting? There's a debate. There was a, a party that tried to summit before him in 1924 and they found their bodies on the side of the, the mountain, but they don't know if that was on the way up or down. So it's, and they're looking for the guy's camera, which they can't find. Um, but that guy's name is, I'll find it in a second, but I guess because that camera kind of sucked. Well, they lost it. So if they had a picture of them at the summit, then they knew they were on the way down. So they either died going up or going down. They don't know. Okay. So Sir Edmund Hillary, uh, sir, he was knighted by the queen, uh, you know, may have not been the actual first person. Okay. So let's talk about Sir Edmund Hillary. He's, uh, he was a Kiwi. Yeah. New Zealander adventurer. Um, he did it. Do you think that 
You think that the Sherpas like taking people up the mountains or you think they're like, these guys are crazy, but they pay a lot of money? Well, they pay them like, I think today it's $5,000 a summiting and they're just doing it easy. I feel like it should be more than that. Yeah. But I think that they're, you know, it's almost, they've been doing it so much to like commercialize it. Mm -hmm. But he was, there was a lot of guys at this time trying to, you know, get to the South Pole, get to the North Pole. Um, but th he was like, I'm going to try to summit Mount Everest. And he was the first to do it. Um, so many people had died trying to do it. Uh, he was in the army, uh, in the Royal New Zealand air force in the air force, not army. And he ascended many of the highest peaks of New Zealand. Uh, and he was also with a British reconnaissance expedition to Everest led by Eric Shipton. And then he was finally in the successful British attempt of 1953. So it wasn't his first time there. But the most interesting thing I found about his going to Everest was he was a big proponent of the dis trying to discover if the Yeti was real. So he actually is quoted as to seeing footprints and have cited seeing the Yeti himself in one of his ascents. But the debate is, was he trying to get funding from different scientific societies to keep letting him do expeditions to the Himalayas with like, oh, you've already climbed the mountain. Why would you want to go back? He was like, well, there might be the abominable snowman yeah. there. Yeah. So he was a huge Yeti proponent. It's actually, it's a genius plan if that's yeah. the case. So that's that might be why... A lot of these guys, such as Graham Hoyland, uh, a mountaineer who also climbed and thinks he saw uh, he saw Yeti prints himself. In the 1960s, the existence of the Yeti was not con considered like crazy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people thought, because um, the locals spoke about it a lot, and scientific journals were trying to just figure out, was the Yeti real? The Himalayas was one of those places that because it was not accessible, that it still had that mystique about it that, you know, sailors had about different parts of the ocean or, you know, people had where monsters lie used to be written on maps. And the Himalayas was one of those places that people didn't know if the Yeti existed. Mm -hmm. So it might have been a way to sort of get funding to do these expeditions. But Hillary, we, we could get in, we could do a whole podcast on Yetis, but Sir Edmund Hillary thought the Yeti was real. Okay. Or at least he lied about it to the rich people he wanted to take money from. Yeah, that definitely is also cap. true. Definitely, definitely was capping. Yeah. But, you know, the local the locals had abominable snowman in their in their lore. So they did. Who knows? Um, if the Yeti was real, like what was what was the driving force behind these guys giving him a bunch of money to go find the Yeti? Was it like find it, kill it, and bring it back? No, there was and actually on display. There was a law passed. Uh, about they were trying to capture it alive. So uh, there was a, they, they put together a Yeti law. Uh, Yeti law. Yeah. So I sorry. think Billy, if you find it, you're allowed to kill it. That's my Yeti law. The sheer amount of firepower taken along by the explorers demonstrates a significant sense of caution toward the animal that might or might not exist. Their armory included capture guns capable of firing tr tranquilizer darts as well as rifles, shotguns, tear gas pistols, and light arms. None of us particularly wanted to shoot one, wrote Doge, but we carried conventional rifles in self-defense. His most accounts of the Yeti describe it as being savage in the extreme. Hmm. Hmm. The group would, so this was the group he sent uh, that he was in that went to search for the Yeti. The group would study local stories, tracks, and relics reported to be Yeti body parts in order to establish or disprove the legend. Our ambition, of course, was to capture a live snowman. Hillary seemed more skeptical. I think there is precious little in civilization to appeal to a Yeti, Hillary reports him saying. So, oh, so here's the, here's the law. Um, the Nep. The, the Nepali government's official 1947 memo outlining the etiquette of Yeti hunt of a Yeti hunt republished in the American embassy in Kathmandu in 1959 and issued to Hillary's party 
as regulations covering mountain climbing expeditions in Nepal relating to Yeti. It stipulates that the search for Yetis required a permit and that a Yeti could not be killed except in self-defense. Edmund Hillary might set off in search of the abominable snowman, then was not wild, conspiracy theory baiting stories it would appear to be today. Yeah, so they thought encountering a wild Yeti was considered a very real possibility. Like, there was laws about this. The Yeti was not just how we think of it. They thought there's a Yeti out there. Mm-hmm. So, hey, I don't know. There's a lot of magic in Everest, and it could be a snowman. I guess there's some maverick. Magic. Where Maverick came from. Like, there's some magic about it, but I'm going to say I hope that Yeti's real, but it's definitely not. Although, so there basically because there's no like animals to eat, we we're talking about the the poop not being able to disintegrate, and you know, it's because there's no living thing on yeah, the Yeah, wouldn't they find Everest. Yeti poop? Yeah, they would. Uh oh. Did I just poke a giant hole in the Yeti theory? I don't know. I like to believe in the Yeti. It's like, why? L- why? Because you know how when you're a kid. Because it's big. You know when it's when you're a kid and like it's Christmas and Santa Claus, like Santa Claus mm. believing in Santa Claus Real, made Christmas. Real, but better. but as a child believing in Santa Claus wasn't doing so in the face of uh, a a knowledge that he wasn't real. You were just told he was real, and you didn't know better. Also, Billy is twenty three years old. Yeah, so. There's a little bit of like difference you're, there. you're told just, that Santa exists. You're a small child and presents show up one day a year. So you're like, oh, that makes sense. You know that this thing isn't real and you, you're you choosing we don't know to believe that. Anyway. But if, you, if the Yeti's out there, like it's just nice to believe in those things. Sorry, I'm the only one on a conspiracy podcast that says cover ups, <laughs> conspiracies, and cryptids. And I'm the only one who wants to believe in cryptids. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You you are. I mean, it'd be cool. We, we, we talk about it. <laughs> it doesn't believe a shit. Well, fuck. I don't believe it, but there was Gigantopithecus. Well, because here's the thing. If there was a Yeti, there'd be more than one. There wouldn't just be one. There'd be a breeding population of Yetis, but they would probably <laughs> be living in a complex cave system uh, that was warm and allowed them to survive. I mean, there is historical con- you know, context for a large ape in that area. Gigantopithecus. Uh, okay. Gigantopithecus was a very large ape um, that lived in uh, southern China. And in mountainous regions, much like the Himalayas. And throughout time, if they finally found a spot that could support them unbothered by humans, who most likely hunted them to the extinction because having a King Kong sized ape living near you wasn't the best, uh, you know, best for property values. So they probably pushed them off their land and persecuted. Not if you're a libertarian back then. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no. So actually, Gigantopithecus is fascinating. It is literally King Kong. That is, yeah, it is fire to to think about. Like if you Google some pictures of Gigantopithecus, they were the biggest chillers ever. They they had red <laughs> hair. And what's funny is that a lot of the uh, accounts of the Yeti say that he had red hair, and Gigantopithecus is now known to have red hair. Is it ginger? Not a ginger, but more mm. of that orangutan type color. Gigantopithecus okay. was, was closely related to uh, orangutans. More so than like chimps or gorillas, we're more related to uh, chimps. So, Gigantopithecus is still a cousin, but he's you know like a second cousin. All right. So here's a fun fact about about Mount Everest. We were pronouncing it incorrectly. Did you know that? Yeah. Mountain it, Everest. It's like Ev Everest. Everest. Yeah, that's how the guy's yeah. name was pronounced. Not Everest. It's Everest. That's huh. the correct way. It costs like it. it costs forty thousand dollars to eighty thousand dollars to rescue a corp on, corpse on Everest. Mm-hmm. They just leave the bodies up there. It's too dangerous. Well, it's too expensive. Well, that's it's also expensive. the same price that it costs to to go up Mount Everest. Everest. Forty <laughs> to eighty thousand. Something like that. Yeah. Hmm. If you want to pay like all in to get there, pay for the Sherpas, pay for the Equipment. I think you have to so get you a can't permit go, too. You can't go dolo. You got to have a little chaperone. Yeah. So this one uh, Sherpa, yeah. Kami Rita, Kame Rita, K-A-M-I-R-I-T-A, has climbed Mount Everest the most times. He was a Sherpa guide who reached the summit for the 25th time on May 7th, 2021. So he breaks his own record, which he held in May 2018. Well, uh, Colin, the guy that 
we have on the show. He went alone, right? That's what it sounded like. I think he was with a group. Yeah. Because he was with that Brazilian woman. No, no, no. He said he met her at the base camp and then found her up at the top. But the way he described it going against like the British guy, he was by himself, I think. Well, the British guy, that was... That was Antarctica. Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, it was that Antarctica. Are you getting mixed up? Yeah, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's been in a lot of places. But I think he also went up with his wife, which is more times than we've done that. Would you rather... Because he's going to get into this a little bit about climbing a mountain with your wife and what it's like bringing somebody that you know you love and that you're sworn to protect and all this stuff. I would argue you don't love them. Yeah. Would you rather take your wife to Mount Everest or take your wife uh, to Nick Cannon's house? <laughs> we'll go to Nick Cannon's house, man. Wait, what? Dro- drop her off. What happens to Nick Cannon's house? She'll get pregnant. Oh, buddy. Drop her off in Nick Cannon's house for like two days. And be like, I'll pick you up later. <laughs> I would argue Nick Cannon's house. What the hell? You is would Nick- rather take her to Nick Cannon's yeah. house? Yeah. Yeah. At least she probably won't die. She's not going to die. Who's yeah. Nick? What, what? I mean, I know Nick Cannon, but what happens at his house? Oh, he oh, gets every funny. single girl he looks at pregnant. He's like, he gets a lot of people pregnant. And he's I, had eight children I've gotten this year. a lot of people pregnant. <laughs> he, this year? He's had eight children this or, year? No, no, no. He's had eight children. I think no, he's I think had, had five, th- four this year, three this year. Definitely at least three kids this year. Yeah. Yeah. How, wait, how many kids does he have in whole? Eight. I think, I think eight, eight. He eight just had one last week. Or not wait, him. He has someone. eight in all. He's got powerful sperm. What can I say? So awesome, Nick man. Cannon just has gone on a run this year. He had his eight kids and he's had all eight this year? No. I, th- I think it's eight in total, and he's well, had like eight, four this year. Eight kids. I mean, okay, having eight kids. There's plenty of people in his. My, like my my grandfather was one of fifteen. Like I that's know. not that crazy, right? But three. Billy, do the math though. If you have three or four kids in a year, it's probably going to be with three or four different women in the same year. They right? can't be fucking. Yeah, but it's not. You know who that I respect? Crazy. You know who I respect? Antonio Cromartie. If, yeah, Cromartie is way more kids. Cromartie, but like his wife. She was like, okay, I'm done. She's She must be a saint. Well, he got a vasectomy. Yeah, she made him get a vasectomy, or they agreed to get a vasectomy. After he had the vasectomy, he got his wife pregnant with twins <laughs> through oh, a vasectomy. Shit. Yeah. Jesus. That boy got this super sperm. Yep. Um, give me some more fun facts about Mount Everest, Billy. Um, I thought you were going to hit me with Nick, Nick Cannon. Fuck, fun facts. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this was about the team of, so Mallory was the group that tried to summit in 1924, a team of climbers discovered Mallory's remains on the high slopes of Everest. The body did little to reveal whether or not he'd actually reached the top. And unfortunately the team's camera was not found amongst his gear. It was believed that Irvin, Irvin Mallory was actually carrying the camera when he made their ascent and that device could hold the photographic evidence of their success or failure to date Irvin's body and the camera has not been found or it has ever been uncovered. It could potentially change mountaineering history forever. That would kind of suck if you're Sir Edmund Hillary. Mm -hmm. So um, when you get up there, we've talked about how nothing is this thing called the timber line where no trees, no plants can even grow. Then there's the death zone, which is when bodies stop or start dying, stop living up to 19,000. So pretty much 20,000 feet, 19,685 feet. You will still find a snow leopard and a Himalayan yak up there. Yeah. Just like chilling. Yeah. Yaks are, yaks were, so the Sherpas love to use yaks to get up to certain base camps. That's how a lot of the base camps were formed uh, because yaks were the only ones that could uh, deal with the cold and the altitude out of it, like any type of animal, be it a uh, donkey, mule, horse, any of those. Um, there's a couple of base camps on Everest. Um, there's two Everest base camps on opposite side of the mountain. There's the South base camp, which is in Nepal. And there is a North base camp, which is in Tibet. There's also, um, a Himalayan jumping spider that lives at 22,000 feet. That's crazy. Imagine getting bit by a spider when you're like 7,000 feet away from the summit. I would be, I would turn around. The craziest part about that is what does the spider eat? If it's the only thing that lives that high. Each other? Well, then there'd only be one spider in the end. Is that how it would work? Well, you know that Rat right. Island story? <laughs> but they have, they, they give birth to so many others. Like, have that you ever eggs. seen spiders' eggs? I mean, but how they, they'd end up eating instead of breeding. 
What if there's just spider one everywhere. giant mm. spider up there because it ate all the other ones? Mm. Oh, or like one spider feeds a whole bunch of spiders feed one major spider, like uh, How to Train Your Dragon. You seen that one? I have. Yeah, it's a great movie. They all they all just work to feed the big dog. So a lot of mountaineers say that K two is actually harder to summit than Everest. Fact. Um. A lot of people <laughs> are talking shit about Everest, say Everest is overrated. It's past its prime. Overrated. Um, past its prime. <laughs> just, <laughs> just literally just chilling there doing its thing. <laughs> Could you imagine people at the bottom of Everest like, overrated. <laughs> the mountain. They got like signs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everest hasn't played anybody. MJ better. <laughs> I mean, Everest it is, is kind of. It is a Mickey Mouse situation because they, they basically did set up a resort. On the yeah. mountain. It's kind of been ran through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, it, that is a fact that K2 is by yeah. far a more dangerous mountain. So K2, I think it's somewhere between 25 and 33% of the people that try to climb it have died. Yeah. That's a much higher death rate than Everest. Yeah, it's like steeper. It's it's a, a cousin of Everest. Yeah, it's, it's pretty very close. close by. It's also just a badass name too. K2. K2. I mean, isn't that the drug? Yeah, the spice. Yeah. yeah. Why they call it K2? I don't know. Huh. What has a higher death rate? K2 spice or K2 the mountain? Definitely K2 the mountain. Death rate of K2. You know how many people out there are smoking gas station weed? 25%. Hmm. Of uh, K2? Well, uh, the mountain? The mountain. Yeah. There's some crazy terrifying videos of people climbing K2. Sometimes I watch them. There's crazy videos of people smoking K2. There are. Then they turn into zombies. Um, in 2005, a Nepalese couple, Moni Mulapati and Pem Dorje, got married on top of Mount Everest. Yeah. They, imagine getting that invitation <laughs> for, the, for the destination. Hey, we're going to go all the way to the top of Mount Everest. Sorry. Nope. Not me. I'll get you a nice gift. Oh, Arian, you're muted. Yeah, my bad. I had a joke, but it's too late now. But, no, just, just run it back. Just it. run it back. What's going? I was gonna say I'm gonna get you a thermos for your wedding present. But it's too late. <laughs> it would have hit if it was on time. You got like eight seconds. <laughs> Did they bring a preacher with them, or they just have one of their mount climbing friends get a, uh, become uh, an officiant? Yeah, just go to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Let everybody get out of the cold for a little bit. Um, so there are no age restrictions if you climb. From, from the Chinese from the side, Chinese side. Tibetan side, it's 16. The youngest person to summit uh, Everest was 13. His name was something Romano. Is it Italian? Uh, sorry. Yeah, um, I kind of like that. Jordan Romero. It's like if you're if if you're dumb enough to try the mountain, just go for it. Just open rules on the mountain. There's a story. So honestly, I I know this sounds pretty cocky, but. I kind of think that we could do it. Everest? Like yeah. as in us? Like yeah. this group of us? Yeah. I'm you, think, you think we could climb Mount Everest? I mean, there's there's a most people who climb it. Like a lot of people who climb Everest are super old. Like the oldest person to do it was like in their 80s. I'm still going to pass. Yeah, that makes that. sense though. When you 80, you like, you know what, dog? I don't really got, there's not much else to do. Rather I die. die. I die. Oh, that. Yeah, right, rather go that. out that way. I bet if you die on the summit, they move you. Yeah, that would... They'd just throw you off. Well, there's this guy... Like, they no, use... You little, like, you can't ruin the summit for well, everybody they else. They use yeah, get the... A little, get a little kick. Yeah. They use <laughs> oh, the... Oh, he fell. <laughs> <laughs> they use Tragic. the bodies as... Uh, damn it, damn it, Bill, you left you left a banana peel up here. This <laughs> poor bastard <laughs> took a nasty spill. Um, <laughs> they use the bodies as... Uh, landmarks so there's a very famous guy uh who wore green boots and green boots guy you always see going up the trail and they use it as like he's a landmark yeah yeah so Jeez. oh that's yeah because their bodies are like preserves huh yeah dude they're not it's like i mean not actually bad comparison but they don't disintegrate what was you about to say I was, he was about to say they're like the shit wow mm. billy I didn't wow. mean it that. Like, I'm just saying beings. they're like, the so two holy carbon. Shit. No, I'm not saying two carbon based wow. objects are not going to disintegrate under those conditions. Same stuff. 
Stardust. I was, yeah. So, <laughs> wasn't meaning like that. So another another interesting fact: a blind person climbed Mount Everest. Yeah, I'm starting to think that we. Just oh, come on, Everest. man! C- come on, man! What? Come on! Did they though. prove what? this person was blind? Come, come yeah. on! This feels man. like a I'm Helen not, Keller scenario to me. You don't think come Helen on, Keller's though. blind? I'm not. I'm not. Uh, she wasn't like. We what? should do an episode on her. Yeah, we should. I, I, got next some, I got some. I got some issues about. Well, her she may have been. Cap on that. She may have been blind and deaf, but she wasn't like doing all the things that the I, the person who wrote the book said she was doing. I heard Helen Keller had white privilege. What does that mean? I'm just kidding. Did you see that one day on Twitter when people were talking about uh, Helen Keller having white? Oh no, You're talking about Anne Frank. I'm talking about Anne Frank. Different sorry. person. Anne Different, Frank had, Anne white, Frank privilege. had white privilege. <laughs> one one person said it, and then everybody was like, "This is insane." Yeah. I gotta look into that. Yeah. I well, here's that. what's gonna happen. You're just gonna go. You're gonna get mad, and you'll be like, "These libs." <laughs> uh, there's nothing that you can say anymore that makes me mad. We have a segment called "Teed Off." Yeah, but those are like, "Ha ha." <laughs> Yo, what's the tweet, bro? Hey, pull the tweet up, man. I'm okay, I'll pull, I'll pull I'm, I'm trying to find thing. it. And it was deleted. It was. Oh, they delete. There's a screenshot. Well, there's a screenshot. Never forgets. It was pretty. Okay, ridiculous. so this guy, his name is Eric Weyenmeyer, and he's born in 1968. At 15 months old, he was diagnosed with juvenile retinoscus with blindness, the expected outcome by age 13. And so uh, he started to go blind and he fought against using canes and learning Braille. He wanted to hang on to his life in the sighted world. And then at age 16, he started to use a guide dog. So this would have been a pretty big long con for him to be like, to pretend to be blind from the age of 15 months. So him and his dog went up there solo? <laughs> I don't think he had his dog. Uh, let's so he went up there solo? He he went up there. I'm sure he went up there with a group of people. Oh, so he was guided. Okay, that that okay. That, I thought you just meant he just traversed the shit by himself. No, okay. like most, pe- right, most right. people, I'd say just about 100% of people that summit Mount Everest go in some sort of a team. Okay. Because you, ha- right. you well, have hey, to have people to secure ropes. You have to have people to take pull the ropes out you have to have people to secure the ladders you have to have people that um pull up certain ladders i don't know if they pull them up but there's a there's a lot of like stuff that you have to do to get through the dangerous parts that you can't do just as one person bruh you talk about complete trust in somebody yeah you lead me up mount everest i gotta trust you man yeah that's that's heavy trust i don't have any trust in a human there's a video if you want to get freaked out of this this team that's going through, we talk with um, with Colin about this in a little bit about some of the ice, the ice falls that they have there, and the different ladders that you have to walk across. But um, there's a video online that you can watch of this person trying to cross one of the ladders. So you're wearing your mountaineering shoes, so they've got spikes and stuff on them. They're not exactly meant to be used on a ladder necessarily, but you have to walk across these big gaps on a ladder. And there's a video of this person misstepping falling off the side they get caught by one of the safety ropes and then it takes like three people to have to pull them up as they're dangling like 500 feet above just well it looks like an infinitely black chasm underneath you so you can't even see the bottom and they get pulled up at the end they get saved but still it's terrifying to watch that was on the side of the that was there's various ways to get up everest and that was on like the the dangerous side that doesn't make sense Mm mm-hmm I don't know why. We could definitely do the the basic ass Everest climb up. Nope, I cannot. That mentality that Billy has right there is deeply explored in the book Into Thin Air of overconfident <laughs> people thinking that they can take on Mount Everest. You should you're basically a main character in that book. He dies. <laughs> but they had that was a freak accident. Not really a freak accident. I mean, you're on a deadly mount. Everything that happens yeah, there is a freak accident. I know, accident. but <laughs> like seeing some of these people who've done it is kind of like if you choose the right day, right weather, <laughs> stay there. Like, no, there's still all sorts of stuff that can happen to you on this climb. Right, right. Of that's, course. That's beyond your control. And I, I guess you once, could describe it as a freak accident, I but mean, there are freak accidents that happen all the time. I know. But I like Just once the I mountain, got there, the mountain, man. I, like, I'm in the talk myself into it stage mm-hmm. where I always talk myself into it. And then once I'm you in the talk I got to do it. it stage, then I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah. This could happen. This could happen. This could happen. And then I freak out and then I'm extra cautious when I do it. 
You should not do this. I'm not going to do it. But. I'll bet you $100,000 you will never climb Mount Everest. Um, You know what? Maybe it might happen. What if I put $100,000 cash on the table? Say within a year. Within a year? Months, well, if, if I had the like funding. For killing Billy. Would I? <laughs> if I had the funding, I, I mean. Imagine, how, make... imagine the downloads the podcast would get, though. Oh, it would like be lit. Billy calling in from a satellite phone. I mean, can we send me to the live tour first? If it made me do dangerous things. <laughs> <laughs> you I'm just want to go that. on that plane and see the Falcons. Yeah, no. If like something like climbing Everest, if you know Barstool were to give me the funding uh, to do it, I think I absolutely could do it. Would you though? That's what I'm asking. No, I was well, it depends. If you guys like, yeah, you can take off the podcast and go. I'd well, like, obviously, hell the fuck, yeah. <laughs> What you're, yeah, if you're allowed to, like, are you saying, like, you'd see this as a vacation? Oh, 100. I mean, you'd still have to be calling in and doing, yeah, the show. yeah, I would be doing the show, I would be doing everything, but like, basically, it's kind of one of those things. Where this like, is funny well, because it's gonna be worth like financing Billy's trip to this is Mount funny Everest. because it, it gives you a little insight into Billy's brain where he is willing to climb one of the most dangerous mountains in the entire world, risk his life if it means that he can take like two months off of doing That's his job. That's not what I'm saying. I would still do it, but like if I still had to like run the TikTok while I was in Everest and like do this and do that, I mean, like blog. Dude, and like Billy, if you think that you're climbing Mount Everest and you're not creating TikToks while you're doing it, you're insane. Has there ever has there ever been a TikToker? To me, that's that would be more actually impressive. yeah, actually. But the thing is, like, like a, a, a blind person climbing Mount Everest, yeah, whatever. He I probably would, had a lot of help, you know. Like he was a trained mountaineer. If a TikToker climbs Mount Everest, that that my friend, imagine if you do a TikTok dance on the fucking top of Everest. Bring Jackson Mahomes. <laughs> no, honestly, the hardest part would be I'd be wearing gloves all the time. And not like the gloves that have like the typing on an iPhone thing. He's already making excuses. I'm not making excuses. As to why he can't do his hypothetical job. I'm making TikToks <laughs> on a trip he's not going to go on. I know, but it, like I, de <laughs> I definitely think I am. I would like really want to do it, but like those the gloves, you know. Well, you know how the gloves. You are. can't type. You can't type in TikTok with the gloves on. But I think I could. I th like a lot of old people do Everest. I yeah, think I'm. You gotta stop this. You gotta stop willing. this old people shaming, man. I'm not, but I think I. That's I, twice. That's twice. There are a lot of there are a lot of female listeners that Arian wants to. Oh meet yeah, that Sorry. you're insulting right now. It's facts. I think you can climb Everest, but especially you, ladies, <laughs> over sixty. If you guys send me to Everest, I'll absolutely <laughs> climb Everest. Okay, so now you're saying that you would do it. I would want. I mean, I'm, I I don't think yeah. I wouldn't think I'd have the opportunity. But if you guys want to make like do it, this let podcast do is doing good, bro. This podcast is doing good. Let's send Billy to Everest. Oh, Billy shit. would definitely die on Everest. <laughs> yeah, no, everyone Billy. thought I was going to die in the ring with Jose Canseco. Everest is going to take a dive. So, yeah, Jose Canseco versus Mount Everest. <laughs> Very comparable things. I got yeah, run the Twitter the poll. <laughs> Macro dosing send Billy to Mount Everest. Run the Twitter poll, Avery. I'll I'll send it out tomorrow after the episode drops. People will have no Perfect. context of why I just sent that tweet out if I did it right now. <laughs> Definitely would like to do Kilimanjaro with uh with uh, Chris Long. He's been telling me I gotta do that. But mm -hmm. you would so if we sent Billy to Mount Everest, would we let him like would we have a team go with him? Like what would I would have to do vlogging myself. No, no, no. But I not a barstool team, not like a content team. Yeah, like, we'd send spider. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> send spider like with would camera. he go in a group? <laughs> Or would we send him Dolo? I Dolo would be. I no, definitely no, nobody. Could do the, nobody does it solo. No. I could definitely but do, do that. Do we hand, send Billy to do it? Well, uh, the hand holding with the Sherpas, I hundred percent could get up there. Like they they have it so down packed. They know exactly when. Like think about it. I think Dave would go. Dave and Billy, Mount Everest. Dave, Big Dave. Big Dave. You think Dave would go? Yeah. No chance. <laughs> that mountain's way not. too way too old for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a joke. <laughs> Making jokes. <laughs> We're having fun. I mean, it's like, what, like 40 million years old? Uh, lit. I love it. It's <laughs> fucking lit. Client. Yeah, we'll get... I mean... Yeah, well, what is the... And plus the gas... I mean, the oxygen the gas, masks. Yeah, well, you would do it with oxygen. I would do it with oxygen. I'd take the easy route up. 
I would <laughs> wait till there's no. See this exact mentality, like calling it like the easy route. Yeah. All this, You're, <laughs> Billy, you definitely think it's way easier than it really is. The there's there's a lot that goes into mountain climbing that you have no idea. Well, I you've definitely never done. prep. I definitely train. The easy route will still be the hardest thing you will ever do. I know. You are not t- acting like I you did know. a 24 mile hike the other day, <laughs> with some serious <laughs> altitude. My guy said I walked for a long time. With, no, there was serious long. altitude. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it on vacation. Like, I definitely okay. have the cardio. Take, take that. I definitely have the cardio if I have to get used to the no, cold. No, it's a completely different type of cardio when you don't have oxygen. When there's and even when if you, you have you, no, we just said Billy, oxygen. Billy, mask. listen to me. It, even if it's, you're using supplemental oxygen, yeah, yeah. you're still struggling to breathe with every breath, no right. matter how. Know, like the most trained. experienced climbers in the world still struggle to breathe at the top of this mountain with. Oxygen but it canisters. takes ten weeks to acclimate to the uh, to the climate. Yeah. So there's it takes ten weeks to actually climb Everest because it takes a lot of time acclimating. And then once you get used to the oxygen, then they let you go up there. There's tons. The reason I know I'm sounding super cocky about this, but there are ways that they like you know, the Sherpas know they have it down to a science. That's why there's so much trash up there because they have so many people up there mm-hmm. to get people up and down. Am I going to be in the 1%? Yes. If a sheet of ice falls on me, yeah. Will I be on that mountain for the rest of eternity? Probably. Uh, depends on global warming. Um, but I th- I think it's a definitely a gamble I'd be willing to take for a, you know experience of a lifetime and for content. Okay. Well, I'm thinking I, about I, it now. Like I wouldn't, I would take it seriously. I'm thinking about sending there. You're the Sherpas problem. Do you think you bro out with the Sherpas? I'd bring the I'd bring the uh, Barstool sports book to the, <laughs> to Katmandu. <laughs> you guys want to gamble on cricket? <laughs> Grow the game. Um, Gurkhas are also uh, from Nepal, and they are one of the fiercest fighting forces of all time. They were positioned between India and China, and they called it being between the tiger and the dragon. Um, and they have maintained a sovereign state for centuries, uh, and some of the fiercest warriors yeah it is, it is crazy to think that um both nepal and bhutan is the other country that's there yeah they're tiny little states or tiny little countries and it looks like they should be swallowed up by either yeah, india or china gigantic both countries that have a history of you know trying to expand their borders yeah but no you can't fuck with the gurkhas i mean it's crazy on two opposite sides of the mountain you have tibet which is mostly a very you know religious peaceful place that no one messed with because they just didn't feel like they were threats until some dickheads decided to try to swallow them up. Um, and then on the other side, you just have the fiercest warriors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wait. I do think the English. Wait. All right. Yeah. Check and see what what happened with the English. I think the English may have conquered the Gurkhas, but then the Gurkhas. Okay. We're, tell you what. This is good. This is good time here. We're gonna jump into our interview with Colin O'Brady. Fascinating interview. Great guest. One of my favorite guests that we've ever had on the show. Um, crazy stories. He's been everywhere. He's been to places that no man has ever been. He's done things no person has ever done. Um, so we're going to talk to him before we do. I want to talk to you about our friends over at Concrete. If you're looking to climb Mount Everest, you need to be using Concrete. That's right. Concrete is creatine, but it's good creatine. It's really good creatine. It is the number one bioavailable creatine with 70% plasma uptake, 70% greater plasma uptake than standard creatine monohydrate. It's the good creatine, right, Billy? Oh, creatine HCL? Yeah. That's the good stuff. I actually took two scoops today. It's one scoop for 100 pounds, and it is the good stuff. I got a serious pump. I took two, two scoops today as well. A lot of people think that creatine is used to bulk up. That's a myth. The fact is creatine helps with lean muscle gains, increased strength, endurance, and fitness. Creatine is a natural molecule that your body produces, and it's present in various foods because your body needs more than it makes. Concrete creatine is the only microdosing creatine, one small scoop per 100 pounds of body weight. It is absolutely, creatine is absolutely required for functional energy in every cell of your body. Your muscles need creatine to perform optimally and grow stronger. And your brain uses about 20% of the creatine in your body just to think. So concrete fuels your body and it fuels your mind. It really does help you in the gym. I notice when I'm taking concrete and when I'm not, much better workouts when I'm taking concrete. It's science to back it up as well. 
It's the good creatine, the HCL, not the monohydrate. Um, hand up, first time I took creatine monohydrate, the bad kind, I pooped my brains up. Yeah. Absolutely pooped everywhere. It was a disaster. With this stuff, it doesn't have any of those side effects. You don't get bloated from it. It's two tiny little scoops. It fits into any drink that you want. If you want to mix it with your water, that's what I do sometimes. It's perfect for that. It tastes great too. So check out Concrete. Take control of your health, both your body and your mind. Build a better you with Concrete. Register now at concrete.com slash podcast. That's C-O-N dash C-R-E-T dot com slash podcast. Receive a free membership to Planet Fitness for an entire year, plus a $500 Walmart Visa gift card. Available now online and in-store at Walmart. That's Concrete. Check it out. And now, here's our very special guest, Colin O'Brady. All right, we now welcome on a very special guest. It's Colin O'Brady. He has a new book called The 12-Hour Walk, Invest One Day, Conquer Your Mind, and Unlock Your Best Life. Very excited to have you in the studio. You've done... Honestly, some insane things. You're an insane person. Um, you've pushed yourself to the limits. Billy called you the modern day Marco Polo. I like that. Earlier. I, I, it works. You're okay with that? that? Billy. Yeah, I'm down with that. <laughs> yeah, but he actually said you couldn't put up numbers back in those days. He said you're good for your era. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, take, take it in stride. You know, I'll take what I can get. He, he, he did say all those things. He said, yeah, you wouldn't last a day on a ship, like a big wooden ship <laughs> trying to navigate the globe. Saying. Well, I did row a boat across Drake Pass. It's the most dangerous ocean stretch in the world. But, uh, you know, Marco Polo had some other things like he didn't know where the hell he was going. He didn't have satellite yeah. GPS. You, you so, had you know, maps. I, I had some you modern had conveniences. Yeah. yeah. So, For sure. so yeah, just looking right now on the list of things that you've accomplished, uh, you've climbed Mount Everest, you climbed Denali, you rode across the Drake Passage, you transversed the South Pole, you went across Antarctica. Yeah. And what would you say is the most, um, what's the most dangerous thing that you've done? Most dangerous. Well, I mean, solo crossing of Antarctica, first person to do that, uh, you know, unsupported, 375 pound sled, pulling behind myself. Um, you know, I was looking for the flat earth. You know, I was. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, you're probably the only person <laughs> with firsthand experience that had like confirmation bias, like the whole flat earth theory. Yeah. It has a lot to do with confirmation bias. It does. Since people haven't seen it, they don't believe it. You're probably the only, like, the only person who has confirmation bias that the earth is round from various different angles. Look, I have, I walked uh, due south till I hit the South Pole and South became North. Um, I did not see the edge of the world. I didn't see the wall. I didn't fall through off yeah. the edge of the map, but I've told that to some flat earthers and they still, they, you know, they still have poke holes in they, the theory. They, they think I'm part of the exactly, conspiracy. Exactly. That's so. nuts. <laughs> uh, I was, Paid shoe. <laughs> yeah. So when you're walking across the South Pole, did you did you actually take like an old school compass out and watch the needle change? Um, so interestingly enough, compasses are very inaccurate at the South Pole because you're also really near the magnetic South Pole, which is what our compasses get pulled toward. Um, and GPS as well, because all the lines of longitude, right? When you're at when you're at the South Pole, you can literally walk through every time zone in like one second, right? The actual South Pole, because you're like, you know, at the bottom of the world. Um, so you have to have a special compass, uh, and it's a compass needle that doesn't let the magnet get basically pulled off course. Um, but yeah, I navigated with a compass the entire time because GPS is actually more inaccurate. I had GPS with me to kind of check some things, but it's crazy. In Antarctica, full full whiteout conditions often yeah. so you know it's minus 30 40 degrees outside um i minus 70 typically with the wind at 50 mile per hour winds in my face i was out there alone for 54 days 24 hours of daylight too so i'm in there in the antarctic summer um so you know middle of the night still looks like high noon and with the wind blowing in my face like that i obviously couldn't see sometimes five feet in front of me so i'm literally i've got this compass strapped to my chest staring down at it and i was walking 12 hours per day we'll get into the 12 hour walk and what that book is about um but that was my daily thing literally staring at a compass it's like almost being in a dark hallway imagine Whoa. imagine closing your eyes and walking down a dark hallway you'd smack into the wall pretty quickly because we can't walk in a straight line as humans without visual was, cues man. so it's insanely disorienting yeah you're but, nuts how did yeah. you know you were walking straight if I had to have the compass, honestly, there's no way. In fact, so much so that at one point I, I tried to never disconnect from my sled because it's like my lifeline, my food, my supplies. If that was gone, I'm screwed. But there's a couple of times. I remember one time I was like, I can't even remember why. I was kind of a little disoriented and like, I'm like, wait, I need to go here, or there. And I just disconnected from my sled because it's 375 pounds to start unsupported, which means no resupplies or food or fuel along the way. So you got to take everything with you. And I still didn't have nearly enough. I, uh, 
was running a 3000 calorie deficit every day because oh. I could only eat so much that I could carry. And so, I mean, I, by the end, I was like 50 pounds skinnier, ribs and hip bones sticking out. Like it was brutal. A guy who attempted it before me actually died attempting this crossing. But the uh, in ter- one time I took, took my sled off or took my unstrapped my sled and I walked just like, I don't know, like 50 feet, like barely. And I turn around and the whiteout had come in and you think you walk 50 feet like your thing, you know, big sled is going to be in view. I can't see anything like completely oh nothing. My and my heart just like fell out of my chest. And I was like, you think to yourself, I just walked this way. I must just be able to turn around and walk back the other way. I had literally you could tell me forward, right, left, backwards. Just it's so disorienting out there. So I was like, I guess kind of like the lesson from Alice in Wonderland, uh, you know, just sit and wait. I just sat there and like waited for a long enough that the clouds cleared and like sure enough, like my sled was, but in a completely different direction than I would have thought it was. Why Why did you do that? Why did you unclip yourself? That's gotta be the one thing that, of all the things that you could do, why would you ever well, like to? I, I'm remembering in this instance, actually what happened was I had, um, I had, I was stopped for lunch. I mean, I would literally stop for like two minutes at a time because it was so cold sitting still. The only way to stay warm is actually to keep moving a little bit. Um, and I pulled out of my pocket. I had like my food rations every single day, the exact amount. So I wouldn't, I was so hungry that I didn't have enough food, but I would like eat yet tomorrow's rations if I didn't have it specific. So I had these bags, these plastic bags that were one day at a time. And I remember that day I actually reached in my pocket to grab this bag out and I pulled a loose piece of trash from what I had eaten out of my pocket and it blew away. And I don't know, like instinctively, like I was like kind of raised in, a, in an environment where it was like, you know, protect the environment, you know, keep health. So I, I was like, oh, I gotta go get that piece of trash. So I just like <laughs> ran after it in the wind and like grabbed the, the the plastic bag. And by the time I looked back, I was like, oh shit, like where am I? You were trying not wow. to litter. I was trying not to litter Antarctica, man. Like, you don't respect that. Well, you've seen what Everest looks like nowadays with all that, Yeah. because once it's there, there's no way to get it out. Yes, it, indeed. We don't want Antarctica to look like that. Antarctica is amazing, man. It's pristine. It's beautiful. It's untouched. The last thing you want to do is, I mean, it seems it's so vast. One tiny little piece of plastic, I probably would make no difference, but I didn't want to leave it out anything out there. So I, I have a dumb question about that walk, and we'll get to the book in a second because the book sounds fascinating too. But if you're if you're walking across Antarctica, are you just, you have to be cold the entire time, right? You don't get used to it. You're actively being cold. Yes. Well, people say this to me, like, you know, be middle of winter in New York City, you know, you're going to go to the bars, the buddy or something like that. People are like, yo, man, why are you wearing a coat? I'm like, because it's fucking winter in (laughs) New York City, man. I'm cold. They're like, you must not get cold. I'm like, yo, I get cold just like anyone else. The literally only way to stay warm in Antarctica um, during this crossing, you never get used to it. Like I said, average temperature is minus 30, but there's always wind. So it's minus 50, minus 60 wind chill pretty much constantly. Um, And that takes a toll on your body, but you you don't get like used to it. I mean, by the end, like I had frostbite in corners of my face. My fingers were cracking from the cold. I had to put super glue inside of them to like glue them shut. There's a there's a phrase in the polar community, which is if you sweat, you die. That's because like, you know, your body temperature raises at some point and you could be in pulling this heavy sled. You could get going enough that your body would actually sweat for a second. But the minute you stop, that sweat would freeze on your clothes then your clothes would freeze to your body. There was one point early on in the expedition. I was having trouble. I was having difficulty. Um, I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. I'll admit it. And I actually, I started crying out of frustration. Like I was like, why'd I do this? Why am I? I started crying. It's a valid question. That's um, yeah. my question actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and pretty quickly, Antarctica smacked me across the face quite literally, which is what happens when you cr- cry and it's minus 30 outside. Well, it turns out the tears, they also freeze to your face, wow. which is like the all time most pathetic feeling ever, uh, in case you were wondering. It's like, yeah, it's punishing you for being upset. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, what's it's, crazy, it's crazy. Yeah. is that one of the reasons why our tears are salty is it's supposed to uh, lower the freezing temperature to not have as much of an impact. So evolutionarily, oh. you were in a place that oh. we were nowhere evolved to ever be correct correct <laughs> that's, that's why that's, that's, yeah i'd like you to address big t's question which i believe is just why but why yeah. you can take that in any way you want but for all the shit you've done just why you know uh we'll get into this a little bit with the 12-hour walk you know i think that as humans we we sit a little bit inside of our comfort zone too often um and i'm not saying you gotta go walk across antarctica but i would argue of, you don't sit in yours enough yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll, we'll find a happy balance between those two things you know i i i'm curious about pushing the edges of human potential um 
I actually early on in my life and it might uh, just after college 15 years or so ago um, I was severely burned in a fire and I was told I would never walk again normally I spent three months in a Thai hospital um, literally I had lit my entire body on fire I was jumping a flaming jump rope you know that's uh, you know maybe not the smartest thing turns out but uh, from that moment, interestingly enough, being burned in this fire, being told you'll never be the same, being told you would never walk again normally, my mother actually helped me um, through that while I'm sitting in the hospital in Thailand. She says to me, she says, Colin, like, this is horrible, but like, let's look towards the future. Like, your life's not over. You're 22 years old. What do you want to do when you get out of here? And my, 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 you know, legs are bandaged. There had been a cat running around my bed in this makeshift ICU in Thailand. It was a bad, bad situation to be in. And she was like, well, what do you want to do when you get out of here? And I was like, ah, no, you know, just downward spiral in my mind. She kind of kept at me and she was, I was like, I don't know if I could do anything, I'd race a triathlon. It's not something I'd literally ever done before. And this was a big turning point moment in my life because my mom could have been like, you know, I said set a goal, but like, look at the legs and the burns. And like, they said, you're not going to walk. Like maybe we set a different goal. But instead she was like, she was like, I love that. In fact, you should start training right now. And she goes, doc, hey, doc. My son's training for a triathlon. He needs some weight. So she literally has this doctor, this Thai doctor brings and I have this picture of me. I'm bandaged from the weight down. There's like pus and gauze and dirt. It's a bad situation. But I'm lifting these 10 pound dumbbells. The doctor's looking at me in this picture like this guy is out of his freaking mind. But I'm like, yo, I'm going to race a triathlon one day. So anyways, that's a long way of saying I did race the triathlon 18 months later. I raced a Chicago triathlon. I actually, to my complete utter surprise, won the entire Chicago triathlon first out of 5,000 people. So that was that was a big surprise on the day. Um, but the point being is like, in that moment, I think my life could have gone in two different directions. Left up to my own devices, I think I would have downward spiraled into negativity and who I don't think I'd be sitting here having this conversation with you. Instead, in that moment, my mother taught me this important lesson, which is I call, I talk about it in the book, a possible mindset. A mindset that I think is an empowered way of thinking that unlocks a life of limitless possibilities. No matter where we find ourselves in any moment in time, like what can we do? What can we create? How can we build? And that doesn't have to be athletically, right? That can be creatively, that can be in family, entrepreneurship, freaking podcast. Like, yo, what can we do? What can we create? What impact can we have? Um, and so that mindset, I mean, I sit here now humbly with 10 world records, but all those world records were set with these legs and all these world records were set with these legs where I was told at one point I would never walk again normally. Mm -hmm. Now getting to some of those records, I specifically want to talk about the Explorers Grand Slam, which is an amazing feat. It incorporates uh, getting to a bunch of these locations. One of them is the South Pole, Mount Vincent in Antarctica, uh, which is a mountain there, uh, Aconcagua. I'm going Aconcagua. To put, yes, in <laughs> South America, another huge mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount uh, the one in Australia. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're hard to pronounce. Yeah. Parsons Pyramid, Kosciuszko. <laughs> yes, uh, Mount Elbrus, North Pole, Mount Everest, in Denali in North America. I mean, they say that uh, not many people has. Do you know how many people have done? I sorry. Yeah, so with the Explorers Grand Slam, it is the those mountains that you were listing. So that's the tallest mountain on each of the seven continents. So the highest point on each continent. Those are collectively known as the seven summits, uh, which of course includes Everest, Denali, Kilimanjaro, like you said, um, as well as completing expeditions to the North Pole and the South Pole. So that collectively, those nine expeditions are known as the Explorers Grand Slam, and it's sort of a high pinnacle of achievement in the adventure exploration community. Now, most people have done that. Um, about 50 people in history had done it when, when I was attempting it. I'm not sure what the number is now, not so many more than that. Um, but typically people do that over five or 10 years, you know, like it's like a lifetime achievement. Okay, I'm gonna climb this mountain, train for it, come back, reset, plan another expedition. Um, but early on, this was my first big world record project back in 2016. I set myself the goal to see if not, if I could not only complete it, but also become the fastest to complete it. Wow. And so we built a whole project around it. Uh, my wife and I, she's actually in the studio, uh, sitting in the corner with us today. Um, and we kind of built this idea to see if I could do it faster than anybody, which meant not taking any breaks in between. So it was like, I get to the South Pole, immediately on a flight over to Mount Vincent, Antarctica. Mount Vincent, right straight to kill Mike. I'm only resting. We had like no money at the time. So we were scraping this together. Um, we you know spent a year and a half trying to raise sponsors and stuff, but I'm sitting like middle seat coach, like back of the plane. I'm like, that's like my only rest between the mountain get off the plane and be like all right go up the next one um but uh just made it uh, in the nick of time 139 days uh, consecutively to set that world record wow wow um talk to me about your book a little bit so it, it seems interesting it's called the 12 hour walk again invest one day cock your mind unlock your best life what is the 12 hour walk yeah so um 
a couple years ago, I wrote my first book. It was called The Impossible First, which was all about the Antarctic crossing. Uh, so if people are interested in that, you can check that out. Um, memoir, that was about the crossing, New York Times bestseller. Uh, proud of that. But this book, um, I'm really fired up. It comes out It comes out today. Um, I'm fired up about the book. Um, the 12-hour walk, as I mentioned, that was my typical duration walking across Antarctica um, day by day, 54 days in a row of that. And my body, as I mentioned, I was so calorie deficient. I was so starved. My body was beat up. Um, but a strange thing happened. As my body got weaker, my mind actually got stronger. I found this like deep clarity, this deep fulfillment um, in my mind as I was making this crossing. So much so that when I got back, I have never felt just so dialed, so focused around just life stuff, around fulfillment, around family, around my priorities, around just crushing it in my businesses. Like I was just dialed in. And I was like, sick, like I found it. I found this meditative bliss like inside of my mind. Um, and that was true for the next couple of years. I did some big projects, started and sold a company, made a bunch of money, had a lot of success in that period of time. And then COVID hit, man. Like I was actually planning to go over to Mount Everest uh, with my wife. Uh, she was going to attempt to climb it in, from the Chinese side, April of 2020. I don't think anyone was going to China in April of 2020. No, uh, <laughs> I don't think they were letting anybody in. <laughs> I'm not sure they still are. Um, but uh Anyways, we're about to fly over there. And just like all the rest of us, like life just like completely, you know, canceled, put on hold fully. Um, and not that like my issues and my life being canceled is the worst thing, you know, for the world. The humanity was, was you know, sort of at risk. All these headlines of, you know, people are dying. The borders are going to be closed, you know. And, and I thought like my mind was dialed in sharp, but I found myself in a pretty depressed, anxious state, man. Just like Googling all this news, doom scrolling the news, just like sitting on my couch. And at one point, uh, we're at a small cabin in the Oregon coast, just my wife and my dog. And I'm sitting there and my wife looks over at me. She goes, hey, you know, you haven't gotten out of your pajamas in like three and a half days. And you're like literally just like staring at your phone, like winding yourself up, like, you know, just kind of like, hey, just just checking in. You all right. And I was like, no, like I'm not good. But I thought back, I was like, when was the last time that I felt like really at peace and really dialed in my body and spirit? And I was like, crazy enough, as hard as Antarctica was, it was also in the stillness and the silence and the day to day purpose of this walk. And so I said to her, I was like, man, I'm grasping at straws here, honestly. But tomorrow I'm gonna go for a walk, 12 hours, like I used to in Antarctica, just right out our front door. And she was like, kind of smiles and laughs. She's like, whatever. She's seen me done all sorts of crazy shit. And she's like, sure, have fun, mm -hmm. see you at dinner. Um, so I walk out the front door, 20 minutes in, my phone buzzes in my pocket. My buddy is texting me, pull my phone out. I'm about to like text my buddy back. And I'm like, what am I, like, what am I doing? I'm like, texting my buddy, I'm like, this walk, like, I need to just be alone. So I put my phone on airplane mode and walk the rest of the time in silence and stillness, no music, no podcast, just like me and my thoughts. Took breaks, but like mostly moving my body the whole time. And I get back to my front door, like feeling good. Um, and I walk in the front door, my dog jumps up on my lap. And then my wife looks at me and she goes, you're back. And I was like, yeah, I told you I was gonna come back after 12 hours. She was like, no, 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 like you're back. Like she could just see it in my eyes that something had shifted and I was like, you're right. Like I feel better than I felt in a long time. Like I needed that, just went into my body, my soul. I feel just like calm and complete, stronger again in my mind, conjuring that possible mindset again. I'm just like, okay, like this is a bad situation, but what are we gonna do to find our way out of this? But I thought this was just a me thing. Like I was like, cool, like I walked across Antarctica and I can like tap back into this thing from walking, like whatever. But over the course of COVID, as we all did, friends, family members, colleagues, you'd Zoom with people like, yo, I'm not doing good. My job just got canceled for my job or I'm sitting in this, you know, this Zoom office in my house. My kids are running around like I'm like going crazy, you know, in my house. And so I just started telling people different types of people about this 12 hour walk, young, old, um, people at different fitness levels. So I was just like, yo, take as many breaks as you want. I don't care if you go for one mile or 50, but take 12 hours to yourself. No music, no podcast, whatever. And a bunch of people took me up on it and it was just unanimously positive for people. People were just like, bro, like I did not know how much I needed this. I haven't spent time alone in my thoughts. It was hard. The silence, the solitude was hard. But by the end, I felt deeply fulfilled, impacted. So anyways, long way, that's the origin story. But I wrote this book and this book, uh, it'll entertain the hell out of you. It's a short story it's about all these different expeditions, points in my life, places where I've been struggling in my own mindset, my own limiting beliefs. If you're, you know, want to just hear about adventures and be entertained, it's that. But at its core, it's really uh, a call to action. And that's what the subtitle, the 12 hour walk, invest one day, conquer your mind and unlock your best life. It's a call to action. My goal is to inspire 10 million people to take this 12 hour walk. And, you know, I've got a website, 12hourwalk.com where you can sign up. There's a, a lot 
lot of research that says if you're just signing up, that commits it, puts it on your calendar. If you're looking for uh, accountability on September 10th, I'm going to be doing the walk. Thousands of people around the world are already signed up to do the walk on that day. You can do the walk any single day. But if again, accountability, it's still just you're doing it alone. You're still in silence, but the knowledge that other people are out there on that day. So long story short, man, this is uh, this is my way of uh, creating something that I think is incredibly accessible, but incredibly impactful. I mean, there's simplicity in it, but there's power and simplicity. And this will change your life, man. This is a reset that people need. And like I said in the subtitle, to unlock your best life, a moment to look inside um, and to really find out what's important. That's awesome. So do you get a sticker if you do the walk? So most people need something they can put on the back of their car to be like, hey, look at what I did. Yeah. So uh, I, I made a, you know, it's a digital world we live in. So I figured the digital sticker might be even more more okay. impactful. Also, you know, easier just to get to people. An NFT. So, yeah, an NFT of sorts. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I, uh, I created an app. Um, it's about to come out uh, the next week or so um, in coordination with this book launch. Um, but the app tracks you, tracks your walk. Um, basically, funny enough, you build an app for something that's supposed to be about your phone. But I was like, okay, people are going to be like, but I get lost without Google Maps. And you yeah. know, I need a clock. And I was like, fine. Well, the app works in airplane mode. It encourages you to take a video of yourself before so you can reflect on that afterwards, put your phone in airplane mode, you start the app and it tracks you. And there's a little line where you go, but you can zoom in and out on like basically inside the app. You're like, oh, wait, where the hell am I? I'm you know, yeah. on this intersection. And then at the end, it says, congratulations, you completed the 12 hour walk. You can see the map of all the place you went, how far, um, and, and a digital JPEG. It will say, congratulations, fill in the blank, your That's name. Cool. Um, you did it. If you were gonna say an NFT, actually, I was gonna be very disappointed in this. Yeah. It's like everything uh -huh. that you've talked about has been like very, uh -huh. I would have been very upset. I would kick you out of here. <laughs> Uh, but no, that's it sounds great. I think yeah. there's actually like some history that would back up the fact that if you spend that much time walking, it does give you clarity and purpose. I know, I think it was Tibetan monks and the labyrinths that they would build for themselves. And when I mean labyrinth, I'm not talking about like, you know, a maze with like a, a big minotaur or whatever. Yeah. It's It's a path that you walk on and it's on the ground and it's in, you know, really one location, but you just take these winding turns around and it's probably like 50... I don't know, maybe like 25 yards by 25 yards, something like that. And you end up walking for about an hour, maybe two hours through all these paths in these concentric circles. And you just walk by yourself with no distractions. And this was like a daily practice that a lot of Tibetan monks actually participate in. And it is supposed to give you clarity, make you calm and kind of center you overall. So I think there's probably some truth and some science that, that goes behind that. Yeah, well. no, there's a, you know, it's cool as, as I've gotten into this, you know, I sort of stumbled across it myself, but I have a deep meditation practice um, and then all the research for the books, like realize that, you know, walking and the reason that this, this exists is that it's deeply embedded in our DNA. I mean, as, as human beings, you know, if you go back far enough in time, we're all sort of hunter gatherer tribes. We're nomadic. We moved around on our feet, obviously very different than modern times. And then, yeah, historically over time, you've got indigenous cultures doing vision quests, um, things of that sort. And so it really is in a lot of ways, tapping back into the those roots, um, those sort of different, different cultural philosophies, but there's a lot of different cultures. Yeah, certainly Tibetan monks is one of them um, that have leaned into walking because there's something about uh, the repetitive nature, your mind being, you know, you know, lit up and also just being outside, moving your body, and then the stillness of the mind. I mean, some people are down for a yoga or meditation or whatever, and some people put off like, oh, that's too woo-woo. I'm not into that kind of a thing. It's like, I don't care what you call this walk. Call it the 12-hour walk. Call it a walking meditation, like whatever serves you. But at the end of the day, I don't care who you are. We need, you know, I think about it like this, like, you want to go to the you want to go to the gym and like you're like yo it's summertime man I want to have those ripped abs the jack biceps you know for the summer it's like we all know what that looks like people will be like cool man so you're gonna go to the gym and you're mm -hmm. probably gonna like eat healthy but you're gonna work out you're gonna hit those reps like you're gonna get the bicep curls you're gonna get the bench press but I think too often I love to say the most important muscle any of us has is the six inches between our ears. And I think too often we don't think of the mind as a muscle. Like if you mm -hmm. want to, you want to fucking dialed mind, like you want to, you want to get that right. Like you got to put the reps in, you got to put the muscle, the, the, the mind on that mental bench press, so to speak. And mm -hmm. the 12 hour walk is absolutely an exercise of flexing and developing that muscle. Very cool. Arian, what do you got? I know you've got some, some thoughts. Well, um, so I used to be a professional athlete and uh, I would like to hear your advice that you would give people um, that when you're at that threshold of pushing yourself to the limits that you don't even know you are uh, capable of. Uh, I've been there many times and what I've noticed is that there's like a little voice in your head that just just weighs on you and continues to tell you stop, 
we've had enough. You've done enough. It's good. You're good. Stop it. Stop, stop. And you kind of had to like fight that voice in your head. And that's a very hard thing to do. And that's like the core and the crux of discipline. And so like, what is your advice that you tell people or have you told people yeah. that uh, combats that voice inside your head telling you to stop? I love that. That's a great question. What sport, by the way, did you play? Uh, I played football. Football. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, no, 100%. I mean, I think you nail on the head. That's such a great question. Spot on. Um, you know, the entire book really is about these limiting beliefs that we all face, that voice, that voice inside of our head. Um, you know, I remember my first day after those frozen tears in Antarctica, actually, you know, I was alone in Antarctica and I, I set my alarm and I thought, man, I've had such a bad day. I'm, I might have to quit. You know, it's only two days in. I told, took the New York Times interview. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this, like whatever. And then I'm like one day in, like, man, I might have to quit. Like, that's a bad feeling. I set my alarm that first day and I wake up that morning and I always joke around. I'm like, yo, who was in the tent with me? People are like, well, I thought you were alone. I'm like, well, no, I was alone, but the five other versions of me were in that tent, like that negative voice, but sort of almost was a physical manifestation of that negative voice, like five different versions of me, like looking at me like, Colin, you are an idiot, man. Quit now. Like, this sucks, man. Like, like you're embarrassing yourself. Like, this is terrible. Like, we know that feeling, right? Like, we beat up on ourselves in our own minds. And that's where that question is coming from. Like, how do you combat that voice? You know, I love to say um, that we are the stories that we tell ourselves. We are the stories that we tell ourselves. And, you know, we kind of get to choose what we tell ourselves. And in that moment, I was just in many moments in my life, I've been beating up on myself. That moment in Antarctica, what I did, and I'll, I'll extrapolate this wider to how, you know, the advice that I give others. But in that moment, I literally couldn't cut through the noise of all this negativity, all these negative thoughts in my head. And so I actually stood up outside of my tent in Antarctica as loud as I could, you know, shouting out loud, not in my head now, I started shouting, Colin, you are strong, you are capable. You are, I was just trying, like, you are strong, you are capable. And that was my daily mantra every day, is literally shouting that to try to quiet this voice um, in my head. The thing is, is that, the, I mean, the, the entire book really focuses on this premise, that's why it's such a great question. Um, but also, one of the things that I love um, and why I'm so passionate about this idea of taking a 12 hour walk is that, I think too many, you know, call them self-help, call them personal development, call them advice, whatever you want to call that genre of book or, you know, content. I think too often that like dot lives and dies on the page or lives and dies on the video. Like someone's giving you a bunch of advice. And look, this book is full of great advice about the 10 most common limiting beliefs I think any of us face. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. What if I fail? You know, what if people criticize me? Like we've all experienced these thoughts in our head before. And the book is full of advice and wisdom. I think if you take that advice and wisdom, it'll go a long way. But my why I say take the walk is that will imprint on your own psyche. That is a somatic, that is a visceral, actual lived experience. And I know for you as a football player and professional athlete, putting your, pushing your body at that level, like no level of hard won wisdom or advice from a coach is gonna teach you how to actually train your mind to that, to actually make that shift, right? Like you gotta go there, you gotta be in the trenches, you gotta bang and you gotta push through that. But one thing I do love to tell people, um, you know, as a piece of advice is, I've come to think of life on this spectrum of one to 10. You know, one being our lowest, lowest moments and 10 being our highest highs. So, you know, one is me burning myself in that fire, being told I would never walk again normally, or those frozen tears in Antarctica. We know what those ones look like, right? And the tens, the tens are the highest highs, you know, setting that world record, the first day, the day your first child is born, falling in love, having amazing sex, like tens, like, you know, skiing, epic pow, whatever like a 10 is for you, right? Like people want to experience the tens. But here's the thing, people want the tens, but they don't want the ones. But every time I've experienced a 10 in my life, when I've reflected on this, I realize that I've only gotten to those 10s, not in spite of my ones, not from hedging against the ones, but actually being willing to experience the ones. Meaning all of my 10s have come because of allowing myself to experiencing some ones along the way. And what I've realized is that too often, People are hedging so hard against the ones. If you take the ones off the table, you take the tens off the table. And I think most people are sitting in this, what I call this zone of comfortable complacency between four and six. Just, I got a job, it's fine. I don't love it. I don't hate it. I go every day, five, 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 five. It's like, yo, I'm in a relationship. It's fine. It's not like abusive or toxic, but like we cohabitate. It's like, you know, whatever, five every single day. And people are so afraid to make that shift or that change. 
And so to answer that question for you, like how do you get people to not quit? Part of it is getting people to start, to take that step outside of the comfort zone. But then when you're feeling that discomfort, when you're feeling that pain, that initial your brain goes, hey, stop, stop, go back to that comfort zone. Just stay at a five. What I love to tell myself, and I say it in the book, which is embrace those ones, embrace them. Because I'm get, I get lit up by them now. It's not like I want to be have crying and frozen tears on my face, but I'm like, okay, this is opening the door. This is actually the pathway to get to those tens. And the 12 hour walk is a simulation of this in sorts. Like, will your feet get tired if you walk around for 12 hours? Yes. Like, if you're alone in your thoughts, you're not used to being that. Are you gonna beat up on yourself a little bit negatively in your head? Yes. You're gonna feel some discomfort. There might be some twos and threes along the way, but every single person I've known to get back to that front door swings back towards that eight, towards that nine, towards that 10. And that's the juice, that's the fabric. That's not another five day that you're never gonna remember, that imprints. And so I tell people, if you're feeling that, if your brain is saying, hey, stop, this is the moment to actually embrace that. Yeah, that, I mean, it's a great point because I, I'm looking back at my life and some of the, um, some of the biggest challenges that I've had, I've actually put myself in those positions intentionally to see if I can overcome them. And then when you do overcome them, great things happen after that. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, this is completely different from what Arian's talking about because I didn't play sports at a high level, but I, I started playing rugby when I was in college. And I started playing rugby because I found myself like being afraid of being in situations where I'm going to be tackled, where I'm going to be tackling people who are, you know, most of the time much bigger than I am. Um, and I wanted to see if I could overcome that. And then it turned out being one of the best decisions I've ever made. I made lifelong friends. I ended up playing for about 10 years uh, and it brought so much joy to me and like being able to go out there and uh, every single day that I'm doing this, I'm overcoming a fear that I used to have like step by step, it, laid, it led to great things. Um, another time I, I quit a job, I was afraid. I was getting into, like you said, like the four to six zone and I wasn't happy with that. I felt bad about it. So I put myself in a situation where it's like, okay, swim or die. You're going to quit, find something else. And a long winding road after I did that left me or led me to right here Amazing. today. So like, I think that there is some truth in finding the things that you're afraid of, the things that your body is telling you do not do sometimes. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, different people have different appetites for danger. I don't think everyone's going to go out there and walk across Antarctica because we're not insane. <laughs> uh, but it's the same principle, which is like, okay, find something that you're afraid of, try to over overcome it because the, in the process of doing that, it can lead you to some really incredible places. hundred percent. I actually had a, actually had a follow up question to that, yeah. man, because um, I, I, I've experienced that. I mean, not today. I don't think to the extent of you, um, putting myself in dangerous situations. I don't fuck with nature. So I, I've definitely, <laughs> Definitely feel you on that, but like um, pushing my my body past the point of physical exertion to the point of where I can't move, literally, mm -hmm. right? I've done that many times, and in doing so, I learned a valuable lesson. Um, subsequently, because what I found, and I and this is my follow up question to you, is how do you balance that with interpersonal relationships in your life? And what I mean by that is. Not everybody is capable of doing that. It takes years and years of patience and trial and error and um, uh, just painstaking uh, trying it out to finally realize what your body is capable of. And in doing so, that is a, is a dangerous line to walk because you then expect that others can also do that. And then the expectation of everybody around you rises in your head. Then you start, and this is what I did. This is why I, I, it's my follow-up question to you. It's a bit philosophical, but so the expectations around you start to rise, and you need to start to judge people on their circumstances and their conditions. So, how do you balance the empathy of other of where everybody else is at mentally, to, in, in juxtaposition with where you're at mentally? No, that's a that's a very insightful question. Um, what I'm hearing is is as you up your game, you start to look around and be like, yo, why, how, how come everyone else doesn't know this lesson? Like, how come everyone else doesn't know how to push themselves, you know, that hard? And then you're disappointed um, by others. You know, I, first and foremost, what I've realized through my, you know, trials and tribulations pushing my body out there has actually brought me really close to others in sort of just, uh, I don't know, that's just, you know, the spiritual side of me, but a, a connectedness to sort of the energy or positivity um, out, out in the world. So that's just like on a personal level. But I totally get what you're saying, which is it's tough, man. 
But that's where, again, uh, not just because I'm here talking about this book, but genuinely what I'm excited about with the 12 hour walk. Like I have had so many conversations about my 10 world records. I give a big speech, you know, on a stage. I do a lot of public speaking for, you know, big companies, you know, the Nikes, the Googles of the world, that kind of thing. And people come up to me and they're like, yo, man, like that was so sick. You walked across Antarctica. That was so hard. I could never do something like that, whatever. And then you end up having that conversation. What I'm excited about with the 12 hour walk itself is the exercise implicitly meets people right where they're at. Like, I'm not saying, hey, train for a year for this. And once you have these skills, come to this, whatever. I'm literally saying everyone's heart is different. What I've realized, like everyone's heart is different for the ultra marathon runner. The hundred mile run is hard for the person that hasn't ever got off their couch. You know, uh, the one mile jog around their neighborhood would be difficult. Right. But both people are experiencing that discomfort, that that push up against their current limits and their current edges in that moment. And so what's fun for me to come up with an exercise is I'm like, I'm like, yo, my 77 year old mother-in-law did the 12 hour walk for her. That was one time around her block. And then she sat on her, on her front porch uh, quietly for an hour. And then she walked another time around her block. I've had a buddy who's a crazy good shape Olympian do 50 miles in 12 hours. Neither one of them is doing the 12 hour walk right or wrong. In fact, they're both doing it right. And they're both succeeding because they're pushing up against their own edges. And so for me, it's a great question. I try not to have that judgment. I'm only human. So of course I've had that judgment in my mind and in my life with others, but it's also to say, okay, I'm not trying to say everyone should walk across Antarctica. I've climbed Everest twice. I'm not saying everyone should climb Mount Everest. I love to ask the question, which is what is your Everest? What is your Everest, right? Like that can be climbing a mountain, that can be starting a business, that can just be falling in love, that can be finding, I don't know, crushing any element of your life, happiness, creativity, family. Like there's no right answer to that question, but I want people to answer that question. And then by pushing up against their heart in the 12 hour walk, however that is defined for them, whatever state of being they're in, you can have those lessons. Cause we're all on a continuum of a spectrum of growth, right? We're all trying to make incremental steps and incremental gains from where we are now to where we are tomorrow and the next day. And so again, I try to let go of that judgment and really teach from a place of, let this meet you right where you're at today and take that 1%, that 2%, that 3%, maybe more percent gain from that into the future. So my personal Everest is gonna be this Thursday, the NFL Hall of Fame game is being played. And it's the Jaguars and the Raiders, two teams that nobody really gives a shit about. And it's the first <laughs> game of the year. And it's gonna be 90% third stringers, fourth stringers. I'm gonna to try to watch the whole thing. Okay, that's my goal for this Thursday. Yeah, was Marcus Mariota gonna get some run off the bench? Mark, what? Marcus Mariota, he's, he's now the on Falcons the Falcons. Oh, yeah. oh but man, I agree with you. Like, I'm well, an Oregon guy, so I'm okay. from Portland, so I didn't realize that he'd been traded. He he got a starting gig again. Yeah, uh, the, he's really excited man. about it. You can tell. <laughs> It'll be fun. That's great news. That's great. But yeah, news. No, I was with you when I was watching him on the Raiders last year. I was like, wow, he's good. Like when he gets in, he, he right. gives a little spark there, yeah. but. Um, yeah, I'm going to be dialed in and uh, the whole no thing. Back. Yeah, whole yeah, you got to you got to keep it on. Commercial All four quarters. Everything. No, yeah. no, no fast forward and through stuff. No DVR like waiting to get in fast forward and the breaks. What's the longest time you've ever spent on a couch watching TV? <laughs> I've, I've spent some time, man. I'm, I'm only I'm only human after all. You're not like uh, a, like one of those uh, like Australian uh, border or the Australian cattle dogs that starts to just freak out when they're inside for too long. Well, I, your wife is saying yes, you are. <laughs> I'm gonna saying, I'm gonna believe her. Well, I will say this: there, there's a chapter of this book that's about I don't have an of time and i opened the chapter by being like you don't have enough time because i hear that excuse from people all the time I'm like yo but have you seen all of game of thrones and everyone's mm. like yo sick show loved it and i was like you know that's 70 hours right there but then i'm like yo me too i've seen tiger king i've seen every game of thrones i, I've, mm -hmm. binged, I've binged my fair share of netflix and i love sports too so. you watch game of thrones when you're like on a treadmill <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's multitasking. That, yeah. That's, that's going to be that's gonna be one of my questions because like the self-help gurus and like y'all are, are interesting to me. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very grateful for everything that you said, but, I, but I'm like, I'm like, well, I always wonder like, yo, what's your vice? You know what I mean? Because it's like you, you're, you're like uh, up top mentally, you just have it all together. But like, what's your vice? You know what I mean? Everybody got a vice. What yeah. would be yours? I mean, look, man, I don't know if it's a vice or not, but like I, I like to, my hair's short, but I like to let my hair down. I like to party. I like to dance. I like to hang. Like I, to me, like the spice of life, like some people look at me and they think, oh man, like that Come out, your vice is Hold dancing. up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> I was going to say is, what I was going to say was everyone, everyone say to me is that, uh, 
you know, they look at me like, oh, that guy must be so disciplined. That guy must like only eat like, you know, raw vegetables and like, you know, only be training like 100% of the time. And like, look, I like to say everything in moderation, including moderation, man. Like I like to go hard. Mm. I like to party. I, I like to hang out as well. So, uh, right. you know, it's, it's when I'm focused on something, you know, I'm focused. And when, I, when I'm not, I, I can be less focused. So I, I'm a human being with all the ups and downs. The book, honestly, I'm, I will say this. The book is written from a perspective of put like literally vulnerably i could write a book that's like yo i'm dope i've set 10 world records let me tell you how freaking hardcore and how i crush it at life like this book is a very vulnerable share of all of the times where i have failed while i've been set back where i was down on myself where i slipped what i fell what i this um and, and the vices and all the doubts and everything in between so i think from a from a potential not not the biggest lover of self-help i i don't think anyone's characterized me as a self-help guru but uh you know i'll, I'll take no disrespect smile i'll take that with a smile on my I, face i like it no i like it man i like it just mo um, motivate motivational speakers yeah like this is, is yeah well no, there, there are a lot of people out there that are in that space that are completely full of shit correct we don't oh, think correct I, you're not uh, you're correct. not alone. oh no we can, we can do a whole no, podcast no, on that. Yeah, Agreed. They, they Agreed. actually yeah, fascinate yeah. me. They're like yeah. the swindlers out there. <laughs> the snake salesmen. The snakes. Are like we were talking about, um, what's his name, John Edward, the other week. The guy that said you could talk to dead people. Oh, I don't know about that him, dude. But... Tony Robbins. Um, there are a lot of people out there that that say they've got all the answers and they don't. I think what you're offering right here is a completely a different ball game entirely. No, I agree. That, that's, that. that's why. You, that's why. Yeah, I asked you advice and you. I think it's based you know. on. I think it's got to be based on experience. You know, if, if you're gonna you if you're gonna you speak to cocaine. something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nah, hey, so so my shorty actually from Portland, man. And oh, so all right. We went, I, I don't. This ain't no like. It's probably nothing to you, but we went on a hike. Okay, nice. <laughs> and it, it was it was it was at Spirit Falls. Have you ever been to Spirit Falls? I think Spirit it's in Falls. Washington. Actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that was yeah. that was one of. My, it's actually where we uh, fell in love. Okay. So maybe you do yeah, like was, nature after all. You say you don't <laughs> fuck with nature, but it sounds like you do fuck with nature a little bit. I do not fuck with nature. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. Like trail paths and like <laughs> shit like where there's no like chance of wildlife i'm straight we'll be good i'm, I'm cool but other than that nah dog you got it it's yeah well i'm see i don't fuck with huge dudes tackling me like your size you know what i mean so <laughs> we, we each have our different strengths man, you go, man. <laughs> push your limits my brother <laughs> so uh I probably have some of the most important questions of the day great. coming up right here great. so you've uh -oh. summited the seven summits of mount everest You've crossed Antarctica. Both these places are, you know. Wait, the seven summits of Mount Everest? <laughs> there are seven summits on Mount Everest? Not seven summits, one of which is Mount Everest. The seven summits of the, of yeah, the world. Wait, the world, yeah. The, the, it's, no, no, no. The, wait, high, wait, the no, highest no. points on every yeah, continent. It's a seven summit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't want to correct him, but uh, I'm glad okay. you did. <laughs> nah, cor always wait, correct. Wait, but you, you've done this. <laughs> oh, I've climbed Everest twice. The seven summits includes everything. Yeah, there's yeah, six other. No, no, what I meant to say is both sides. Should we have done. him pronounce the mountains again? Does he need no, to pronounce those mountains? No, 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 if he does it in a Russian <laughs> accent, he'll actually he'll be able That's to do it. That's a terrible. No, but talking about <laughs> doing both sides of Everest, you spent a lot of time on Everest. Yeah. You know, Sir Edmund Hillary once talked about seeing footprints in the snow and uh, in the great wide outdoors in Mount Everest, hypothetically seeing a Yeti. Have you ever seen a Yeti? I have not seen a Yeti. I have not seen a Yeti. Um, although... I have had some pretty intense hallucinations out there. That's what I want to uh, ask you about. So <clears throat> when I was crossing Antarctica, there was actually another dude attempting the crossing at the exact same time. We didn't know about each other. We planned our thing. Like people have been trying to do this crossing for like a hundred years. Like I died trying, people have run out of food and had to be evacuated and rescued. But it's like been in the zeitgeist of exploration. Like can someone pull off this solo crossing? So I train for a whole year. I'm about to fly down there. I do this article with the New York Times says, hey, I'm going to try to do this thing that people say is impossible. And the same day that article comes out, this British dude took like the exact same interview in London on the London Telegraph says like Captain Lou Rudd, a special forces badass is attempting this crossing. Turns out when you say the same, when I say the same time, I don't mean like within a few weeks we arrived there. Like there's one guy with one plane that can take you to the edge of Antarctica and there's one season where you can do it. We called up the same guy and before I know it, we're sitting shoulder to shoulder in a cargo plane getting flown to the edge. And this guy is, this guy's special forces, British special forces, like equivalent of a Navy SEAL um, in the British military, total badass, hardcore dude. Now I'm sitting shoulder to shoulder. He's looking at me and he's going like, hey man, should be a Brit that cracks this journey first. And I'm like, I'm like looking at his sled, like, did he bring the sniper rifle? Like, you know, like <laughs> yeah. what's going on in here? So anyways, he kicks my ass in the first week hard. I do pass him on the sixth day. I start getting into my 12 hour rhythm and getting out there. 
And he said some pretty intense words to me when I was passing him. But, you know, I stayed in front of him. I thought I was in front of him. But every single day I was looking behind myself. Like literally wow. every single day I'd wake up and look behind myself. Like the storms would get so bad. But I kept telling myself, if I don't go out of my tent today, Captain Lou might pass me. I got to stay. I want to be first. I want to be like have that historic world first. I had no idea where he was. So I spent like, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks looking over my shoulder. Day 40 or so arrives. I pass him on day six. It's day 40. So I've now literally not seen a human being for 34 days, not talked to anyone. I'm completely in silence, like this endless white abyss. There's nothing to see. And I call my wife every single night on a sat phone just to do this quick, like medical check. Like, and she's asked me some basic questions to just make sure like I haven't like completely lost my shit. And that day when I'm walking, I get it in my head and I'm like, is Lou real? <laughs> like, like yeah. is captain lou like is there like is there a british special forces dude out here chasing uh -huh. me or did i completely make this shit up because and i'm like man i'm losing my shit and i was like so i'm like okay but then i start thinking to myself like either he's real which is a motivating source or he's not real and i have one hell of an imagination i was like that's cool too because it gets me out of this tent every day but i literally get on the satellite phone call my wife and i say to her i go i got a real question for you don't make fun of me is Lou real? And she's just like, <laughs> yes, he is real. And then she hung up the phone and called my mom and was like, yo, our boy's losing his shit. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. So so at the moment that you passed him, was it like, did you give him a little wave? Like, oh, did, wait, you had to be like on your left, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what actually happened, what actually happened is I didn't, I thought like he smoked me so hard on the first day and the first couple of days, I literally thought I was never gonna see this guy again. I was like, just gonna be lucky to try to finish or like, I don't know. But on the sixth day, I spot a tent like way out on the horizon. I'm like, holy shit, there's a tent. I'm pretty sure there was nobody else wandering around the middle of Antarctica by themselves. Could like, have been where Alien is. It, I know Alien versus Predator. I saw the end of that. They've got a whole nest underground there. Right. The so thing. The thing. I mean, uh -huh. there could have been a Yeti, you know, mm -hmm. but I was like, probably Captain Lou. Looks like his tent. But it's a whiteout. So I'm thinking I can like kind of sneak past him. It's early morning for me. So I start going past him. But I get about 50 feet within the tent and I hear this coughing <clears throat> and this unzipping of the tent. And he like pops his head out and he starts like doing this like set slow kind of wave, like that kind of King of England, like on a float, like kind of <laughs> wave, like at me. <laughs> And he's like, hey, and I was like, just kind of like, hey, don't mind me, just, you know, whatever. So I keep walking. And in a whiteout, I mean, it's hard to navigate anyways, but it's- <laughs> Don't mind me, just better than you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I, I look down, I'm, I've got this compass out, right? Because I told you, it's insanely hard to navigate and it's a super bad whiteout this day. So I'm like staring at this compass and it's extra slow going because it's like two steps to the left. You got to move the compass. You're like trying to figure out how to get in the right position. It's really hard to navigate. A couple hours later, I look back behind me and Captain Lou, is there but he doesn't have his compass out he's just like casually just like watching me navigate and letting me like do all the twists and turns he's like slowly walking behind me like letting me do all the work cutting the trail and i'm like Fuck, i'm frustrated so i finally slow down and i force him to come up beside me and he comes up beside me and i'm thinking like you know we're gonna have an intense exchange but instead he's like all chipper he's like hey uh good morning mate you know how you doing and i'm like what the fuck? like <laughs> and he's like hey I, actually i got a bit of a suggestion for you and I'm like, okay, special forces dude walks up to you all chipper, like with a suggestion, mm -hmm. like pretty sure this is not like going in a positive <laughs> direction. And so I look at him and I'm like, hey man, we both know the stakes out here. We both know someone's died trying this. Like I go, before you say anything else, I'm just gonna tell you, let this be the last time we speak. Like, I do not want to speak to you. We are supposed to be alone out here. Like, I will like, I'll see you later. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yes. And he he pulls up, we were like full face mask, right? Because if our skin was in this, in the uh, exposed to the cold air for a few minutes, we get frostbite. But he pulls his mask up for a second. And he just stares his eyes into me and he's like, all right suit yourself like as he was going to give me the biggest greatest suggestion ever but then it was hilarious because i was like and i will see you later we're both pulling like 350 pound sleds behind right. us like see you later and we're like shoulder to shoulder i will see you yeah, later no, it's, it's like <laughs> back in middle school or high school when you say all right i'll, I'll catch you after class and then you guys both walk the same direction exactly right it's like super awkward and you're like yeah. all right well all right so then we literally ignore each other but that day this is actually where the 12 hours comes in i was in my mind i was like I'd never thought I could go more than 10, but I was like, I'm gonna take at least one step further than this guy. 
<laughs> eight hours goes by. He's still literally right next to me. Nine hours goes by. He's right next to me. We're both just like looking forward, ignoring each other. Ten hours goes by. He's still there. I'm like, shit, I got to look at happen. Eleven hours. Finally, he reaches down and grabs his tent. I'm so exhausted. I think I'm going to like fall over. But I like try to play it cool. And I'm like, whatever, I'm just going to walk another mile. And so I just like stumble my way another mile and take my first lead in the race. But that night, my wife, she says to me, she goes, I've been meaning to tell you this, but I've been running the spreadsheet back home. You're not even close to going far enough per day. So if you don't switch to 12 hours per day, you're going to run out of food out there so cool that you've done it once just do it another 50 times and you might be good <laughs> jesus <laughs> that that's intense that honestly it sounds like a movie out there do you still have all your fingers and toes fingers and toes all intact so for to me that's what success looks like every time that's the yeah. most important thing do you have your appendix uh no oh yeah i do have my appendix okay oh wow I, billy hmm. no uh, billy may have told a lie on the last podcast yeah. then he i said. heard i heard like a rumor that you can't go to antarctica if you have an appendix because you might get appendicitis and die and there's no way to take I, it out you know it, it was I, this has actually been said to me before there there have been people that have said you should do that like preemptively i've never done that i have done like some dental work and stuff just to like you know like if you have like a lingering thing it's like get all the things dialed because like your hmm. teeth like can like really screw you up because they're down to the cold and like stuff like that but i i did not remove any organs um to uh <laughs> I, I think the rule is if you're going to spend time on whatever scientific yeah. research center that they have down there where um, it gets frozen in over yeah. the course of a winter, you have to have your appendix out already yeah. because if it does rupture, then That's there's no way that they can get it out and you're just gonna die well, down there. Uh, so not my first, the, on this long crossing, I couldn't like obviously go into any buildings that would have like stopped the unsupported. But at the South Pole, there is a scientific research base that's run by the US government. And my previous time in Antarctica, my end of my expedition ended there on the Explorers Grand Slam. And so uh, they invited me to come inside this research base. So I went into this tour of this research base and it was crazy. The walls are, first of all, they're like two foot thick, like metal doors. Because in the winter, I mean, the summer minus 30, minus 40, winter is like minus 100 and pitch black for six, six months straight. And 15 people keep the base going over the winter. And the woman giving us the tour, I was like, she's like, oh, I have a couple jobs here. I'm like, she's like, I'm, oh, I'm not just a tour guide. I'm obviously that I have like a random tour guide down there. She's like, I'm the doctor. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I was like, so what's your specialty? She's like, I'm just like the everything doctor. And I was like, we can't know everything in medical school. She's like, I don't. But like, she's like, they just give, I have, I have a room full of all the tools. And she goes, oh, I did a, a tooth extraction the other day. I had to do this other surgery, like via YouTube. She's like on the phone back home to another doctor. Like, okay, make the cut here. Do the thing like here. Oh, like, you, gotta, so, you gotta be able to do it all. You, you can't got, say no. You can't say no. So it, that, was, that was wild realizing you're far out there. They do have one doctor, but it's not like every single thing and they don't want yeah. an appendix or things like that. You know, yeah. just to. to well, one, a Russian doctor took out his own appendix in Antarctica. That's pretty metal. Yeah. 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 That rocks. So when you see David Goggins, who just does a lot of miles, but just like in America and not too intense, are you like, that's kind of soft? <laughs> uh you know i'm not gonna sit here and call out goggins you know i think what he's done he's motivated <laughs> no, a ton yeah. of people but uh but yeah you know uh you know he's done a lot of stuff on on, on home soil i'd love to see him get down to antarctica see how he fares down there <laughs> like the, you, he, doesn't, you, he doesn't play out of conference road games yeah. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like that is crazy you like did mega marathon in antarctica Yes, correct. Whoa, correct. Battling a, a you know a David Goggins type of guy, special yeah. forces dude out there chasing after me. So how how is it compared to the real thing? Because I saw that there's tents and bands that play. Yeah, so Are there we bands on Mount Everest. We we do it a little more bougie <laughs> for our event, twenty nine and twenty nine event series. Um, you know, you pay to come for the weekend. We rent ski resorts out. You know, we've got an event in Whistler. We've done Sun Valley, Utah, Vermont, um, etc. Um, and it's great, man. You know, the challenge is we give people thirty six hours to climb the equivalent vertical feet uh of mount everest mm -hmm. but you get to take a gondola down so it's just up there's no there's no hiking down the down's hard man even on climbing mount everest 80 percent of the real everest 80 percent of climbing accidents happen on the descent because you know you get to the top and you're like woohoo i made it it's like wait yeah. i gotta get all the way back down i'm exhausted um but it's a good challenge man it's cool like uh, what i love about that event and why we created it to host the event is that Again, it's kind of like I was saying about the 12 hour walk. You got to train for it. You got to push like hard for this 20 hour 20 minute. But like people have come to that event having never finished a 5K or a 10K before and grind it out for 36 hours and get to the top. But also we've had people, we've had Olympians who's actually had a couple NFL guys, you know, kind of like bigger, like jacked, like dudes come and like not be able to finish it or quit halfway or whatever. Mm -hmm. We get, it, it's about 50% um, success. But to your point, we got chiropractors, we got massage therapists, we got nice food. 
I, on my two experiences climbing the real Everest, we don't have that. So that, okay. that's the part that's that's not stimulating. Uh, it, but it's a good well, challenge. You know, I'm down, I'm down for the, what, what, when do y'all do this? Uh, we got five events this year: two in two in Utah, two in uh, Whistler, uh, and another uh, in Vermont. So uh, yeah, holler at me. We'd love we'll love, we'll love to have you, man. Hey yo, I'm definitely gonna go. I'm gonna bring the shorty, and we gonna we gonna do it. Man. Heck yeah, I fun. love it. I love it. That'd be fun. Yeah, it's a good challenge. Um, so. You know, the, 36 hours. Th you got 36 hours to go 29,000, 29 feet. My wife's sitting here. She's done it. She's done it a couple of times. Um, it's a good challenge. And it's also a dope community. What ends up happening is like, I might be on lap five and you may, might be on lap six, but like we end up walking, get, you know, with each other through the night. And he's like, you know, if you're going to have, you, you open up to people, right? Cause you're mm -hmm. like, oh man, we're both out here doing this crazy thing. And so by the end of the weekend, you know, a couple hundred people, you feel like made some new friends, met some cool people. Cause it also, you know, it attracts somewhat of a like-minded crew of people. The one thing that's different about it though what i will say in strangely harder not actually harder than climbing the real everest but you don't climb everest in one chunk like you don't climb from sea level to twenty nine thousand feet in one right push. you gotta acclimate you gotta acclimate base camp is at seventeen thousand feet you're over there for a couple months you go up and down up and down so the fact that you do it straight through um is, is quite a lot of vertical feet so yeah you strike me as a man that's uh dined on quite a few stews you big stew guy when well, you're I've on the mountains. Had, I've had a stew or two. I've had a stew or two. I feel in my like day. that. That's that's the real attractive part of mountain climbing to me is getting to eat those stews late at night, just warming your entire body. I up. mean, there's nothing quite like you know. It's like sleeping when you're tired. So good, mm -hmm. right? Sex when you're horny. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Pretty right? good. Pretty good. Pretty for good. me at least. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like I yeah. can't speak for uh, whatever. Yeah. You know. But a warm <laughs> cup of something, of food when you're starving and it's cold outside. I yeah. mean, yo, that's the jam. For the sure. best. What's the best super stew that you've ever had? Whew. And I, I'm not talking strictly flavor. It's a combination of the flavor and also how you're feeling at the time, how cold you were, like the soup that hit different. Okay, well, I'll say this, is that <laughs> so what comes to mind, I'm proud if I rack my brain and think of multiple examples, but the funny version that comes to my mind is, at the end of Antarctica, I was so, I literally didn't have enough food from day one. So 54 days in, like I had just been just starving. I was a bag of bones. And finally a plane comes to pick me up and takes me back. I can't leave Antarctica right away. It's like, it's like a week to unravel the logistic. But the first place they take me is back to this like little, kind of like makeshift camp. It's got like a shack and like a little like chef, not a chef, like a woman cooking some stews basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I haven't like eaten a proper amount of food in like 50 some days. My, haven't even showered yet they're like there's food in there i was like food <laughs> i go inside this little hut and there's like a buffet and it's got like this warm soup it's got pasta it's like it looks like a five star you know five star meal through michelin chef but it's like just basic like whatever mm -hmm. and i pile like four plates full like it's like you're like a, i don't know yeah. just like literally pile as much as i can on this plate and eat all of it and immediately my stomach has shrunk like so much. I'm in like gasping pain. Like there's like sharp like needles sticking into my stomach. I'm like, ah, but my brain is like, I don't even care, man. Yeah. And I walk back up to the buffet and I feel four more full plates up and eat all of them. I probably eaten 20,000 calories at this point. Now my stomach is like literally like, you're gonna throw up and, you're yep. like, ah. and I was like, dessert did somebody say dessert and i walk up and there's a full pumpkin pie and i was like i'll just have that whole thing and just take a whole pumpkin pie off and crush that and then wander back to my tent and like sit there in the fetal position my mind was so satisfied my body was so angry that's so, gotta be an incredible feeling it though. was a good feeling man you know sometimes when you're when you're that starving i was like i don't care i at, don't care about the sharp pains at the end of the hike across antarctica did you just did you stay out back and just like wait for the british guy to show up just checking your watch when, when you got there <laughs> It's funny you should say that. I actually elected to actually have the plane not pick me up as quickly. He was uh, two and a half days behind me. And I said, um, you know, I was like, you know what? There's seven billion people on this planet. And it was intense and it was a battle. But at the end of the day, I actually kind of let not let my guard down, but I softened that I was like, maybe because I was first, but also I was just like, you know what? Like the camaraderie of this, like there's one other dude. And so I elected to, to wait for him at the very end um, and to be the first to congratulate him. And we have uh, we've yeah. actually be become <laughs> friends over time. So do you know what the um, advice he was trying to give you was? He didn't say that, but I will say the first thing he said to me, and I think he meant it as a compliment, but when you really read between the lines, it doesn't feel too much like a compliment i was there and i was like congrats man like you did it's like you know no one had ever done this now you've done it second but mm -hmm. you know whatever <laughs> um, <laughs> um and he said to me he goes you know i wasn't too worried about you this entire race and i was like oh and he was like 
you know, because I just figured Antarctica would just take care of you at some point. You're pretty inexperienced. And if, <laughs> the positive point of that is she's like, good job. You didn't die. The yeah. bad part of that is like, dude, I just expected you to die. So I just wasn't that worried about you. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, let me, hold on, let me bang for it. Let me, let, let me bang for Let me bang for my guy right quick. Because if you think about it, you counted you out too. True, man. true, true, true. <laughs> you can't really, you can't really knock him. That was a compliment, man. You take I, that I, I choose to take that yeah. one as a compliment. It's also yeah, just, you know, like he came in second. He's probably not happy. You know, he yeah. wishes nah, he was dying first. Yeah. But exactly. yeah, it's just, just two competitors. Right. Going head to head against each other. But you guys are on, you're on good terms now. Totally. I mean, I think in, in the, in the realm of good sportsmanship, whether you're talking about that, you know, at a Super Bowl, you're talking about that, at, you know, Olympic track rate, like whatever, you know, as a professional athlete myself for a long period of time, when the rate when you're on the race course you're doing everything to win you're trying to do or die but i've always lived by as much as you might be personally disappointed that you didn't win you know there's a lot of races in my professional triathlon career that i didn't win that you still want to give you know competitor a hug and, and, a, and a high five and say look man like you were the better man on the day yeah i mean so, you guys are competing yeah you want, you, you're competing you're trying you to win wanted to be the first person to do it yeah. and like it's no secret going into it that one right. of you guys wanted to win. Right. You weren't going to hold hands right. and walk across. But the at ice the end of it, when when you're across the finish line, you know you got to at least show some respect. Yeah, and, yeah. Of so course, we've been able to stay friends. Um. So when it comes to real Everest, I, wanna, I had a couple questions about Mount Everest because we're this entire episode is going to be wrapped around a discussion that will probably be much much stupider than the conversation we've been having because I think Billy wants to talk about Yetis for about forty five minutes. They're- I promise to people listening. We're going to limit B- Billy's Yeti talk coming up. Yetis play a huge role in the exploration of Mount Everest. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll get into all that. I'm I'm, t- I'm sure of that. Um, <laughs> the first time you climbed Everest, were you were you scared? Do you do you experience the emotion of fear? Because I know that we've seen you know the documentary of Alex Honnold, and we talked to him a, a few years ago, and his brain's just wired differently. He doesn't feel fear. Do you feel scared when you're doing these expeditions? A hundred percent, man. I think that. You know, there there's a discerning level of fear. I mean, fear exists, right? To to kind of keep us alive at, at its base level. Um, again, we're talking about those you know four to six range. I do think it's good to take on some risks to step outside that comfort zone. But yeah, man, like there's plenty of times when I've been afraid. One of the um, you know you pass dead bodies when you're on Everest. Um, they can't take Sheesh. they can't take all you know literally. And I've heard, you know, before my first time climbing, I'd read every book. I'd read, you know, John Krakauer's In It Thin Air in the late 90s is like a book that it's about an Everest disaster where eight people uh, died. But for some reason, that inspired me. Um, that I don't book know makes it. me cold when yeah. I read it. It's just got like <laughs> 500 different words for ice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but what I will say is that um, so you read in that and one of the things is like there's dead bodies on the route climbing Everest. And of course, you ask yourself, like, why? Like, you know, someone should take these down. And people always say, like, look, like. You can barely, if someone breaks their leg, you probably can't carry them down. Like you can't carry anything. You're not, you definitely can't carry a dead body. You're going to endanger yourself more by trying to do so. And it's nearly impossible, if not impossible to move that. And I always thought to myself, I thought, I thought, you know, well, yeah, that may, I hear you saying that, but if I was like in a rescue situation, like I would definitely pick the person up or, you know, whatever. And after I summited Everest the first time, I, I come off the summit and there's this knife edge, long knife edge ridge coming off the summit. It basically drops off like five, 10,000 feet on either side. And you're just on this tiny little icy precipice, very ma- gently making your way across. And that's enough to just get your adrenaline spiked and you're exhausted, you're tired, you can barely breathe. Um, but then I get to this right on the edge of that, there's a place called the South Summit. Um, little tiny little flat spot just around, surrounded by endless drop offs. And there's a woman lying there on her back with her just her eyes rolled in the back of her head and i was like oh shit and then i looked closer and i was like i recognized her as a woman i had met in base camp a brazilian woman by the name of tice and i looked down and i'm like oh my god like this is the moment like this is what i oh if someone's this like i'm gonna help them and i lean down i try to put my arms around her and do my very best to like pick her up and i very quickly like i can't move her an inch like i can't i can't move there's no way i'm moving her like down this mountain i'm like oh like shit like there's there's nothing you can do. And I start yelling. I start yelling. Tice, if you hear me, you got to get up. And the guy she was climbing with, he had her oxygen mask and it had gotten frozen with ice. And he's trying to chip this ice out of it. And he ultimately, thankfully, the good part of the story is he he gets that chipped out and he puts the oxygen mask back on her and she gets up. Um, she actually summited the mountain and made it back down safely, which is crazy. But it was this intense moment of like, whoa, am I going to like watch a person die here? And am I going to also have to just keep walking? Because there's nothing I can do. I got to save myself. So when I went back to Everest uh, last year, I went over there with my wife 
And a whole other crazy story I talk about in the 12 hour walk. She wasn't originally planning on climbing, but the badass that she is, she decided to go for it and push for the summit. And we got her which prepared and ready to go. Um, but that was in the back of my mind that whole time, which is look like if I couldn't move this woman, like it's my wife, this person I love more than anything in the world. And we're going to go what's called the death zone above 26,000 feet on Everest is called the death zone for a reason because the human body, even if you're using supplemental oxygen, is slowly dying. And I remember that feeling of like this woman lying up there and I just started playing in my mind over and over and over again. I'm going up there with my wife. I'm supposed to be protecting her, looking after her. Like if she trips and falls, if something happens to her, what I'm gonna have to walk away like from my wife. So look, man, like seeing dead bodies up there, I've been hit by an avalanche on Everest. I've seen, you know, this woman, Tice, like I I've seen some stuff up there that is definitely, there. there's a no shortage of fear, that's for sure. Yeah, it sounds terrifying. Um, not for the faint of heart. Now, wh where do you stand on the oxygen match? mask thing did you use supplemental oxygen i use supplemental oxygen uh my first climb i was trying to do that speed record for the explorers grand slam so quite literally wouldn't have been over there long enough your body needs to acclimatize even longer and even that i was cutting it short i was only on the mountain for about three weeks coming from sea level to the north pole usually there for eight plus weeks before you attempt that the second time i was over there to actually gonna attempt without oxygen um a different project over there um but then when my wife decided to climb um I decided she was going to climb with supplemental oxygen. And for me to be the most lucid that I possibly could be, I chose to use oxygen. Here's where I stand on it. I think that um, it obviously makes a difference. Um, it's more difficult to climb without than it is with. Um, climbing with oxygen does not take away from the challenge, the death defined nature of it, the intensity and the fulfillment that you reach from, from reaching to the top. Um, I think the biggest thing is the, the, only, the only knock that I have is where people have People have done weird stuff where they've like climbed with it, but then claim they didn't climb with it. Yeah. Climb, you know, to me, like that's- Just own it. Like it's, own, it's like, I'm, you're, not, I'm on the summit of Everest, man. Like there's nothing to like, yes, I use supplemental oxygen from this camp to this camp or whatever. That's like, still incredibly impressive. Yeah. If, if you tell me that you did it without oxygen, I'll be like, well, you, I think you kind of want to die. Yeah. Uh, but if you do it with oxygen, it's like, wow, that's really impressive. I don't think there should be any shame in doing yeah. it that way. So to me, with, with all climbing, I mean, Alex Hanna, what he did is one of the most insane human accomplishments in my history to climb that without ropes. Like, you know, just from the craziest, the crazy to the day, I was just like, say what you did and like, be proud of that. Like, no, no, no like, harm. No foul. Um, sounds like it's like, you know, reading a book versus listening to the audio book. That's what it says at the dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that analogy. I mean, still, it's it's ridiculously impressive to, to climb Mount Everest. What's the um, what's the most treacherous part of climbing the mountain is there one um specific pass or i know that you know there yeah. are some crevasses that you have to go over on the ladders and all that and yeah there's the ice field Pro yeah that's also Probasses. extremely dangerous yeah <laughs> is that what it is, is yeah, it yeah, crevasse? yeah crevasse yeah crevasse yeah. um oh the uh you know a lot of people think about the summit and there's obviously reason that like you know there's dead bodies up there and but the most scary slash dangerous part of mount everest actually happens on the lower part of the mountain which is from base camp to camp one so literally just leaving base camp you're at the toe uh basically the bottom of this glacier called the kumbu uh kumbu icefall and this is on the nepalese side the chinese side is different but uh the most more common route is the nepalese side that's the you know where surya had manually climbed through and the ice fall is basically this consistently moving glacier. Uh, so there's no snow on this, which means the crevasses are not filled in. And so you're, you've probably seen photos, you can look on my Instagram, you see photos of these ice, these ladders going across these crazy crevasses. Um, and there's not just one of them, there's like 50 of them. You're walking on these metal rickety aluminum ladders if they fall or if they shift, like you're gonna end up at the bottom of a two, 300 foot crevasse. Um, and what's the craziest part about the Kumbu ice fall is that it's constantly moving. It's literally a moving ice fall. So it's a frozen waterfall that is consistently moving. And so as you go through there, you go through in the middle of the night because during the day it's a little bit warmer. And so the ice is melting a little bit more. But even when you're going through there in the middle of the night, you're constantly hearing this like creaking and you're looking up above you and there's like a school bus sized block of ice and you're just literally saying you're playing Russian roulette you're going like I hope this doesn't fall today I hope this doesn't fall today in 2015 um or 2014 excuse me uh a big shift happened in the ice fall and 16 Nepalese Sherpas were killed um in an instant and there's a lot a lot of deaths and a lot of dead bodies uh in that ice fall um because it's it, again in mountaineering, you talk about objective hazards and objective hazards are things like a big rock fall or an ice fall or something that would like, you know, fall on your head or shift. Um, 
And you try to avoid those as much as possible. It's one thing to be like, my climbing skills need to be good to get up this wall. So I need to hit this move or pull up or be strong enough to do this. But objective hazards are just like stuff you can't control. Like you're like, go walking under this ice field or the Kumbo ice fall and you're like, well, hope it's not my day. I'm going to move through here as quickly as possible. And so definitely when you step on that mountain, um, you know, you hear a lot of epic stories of the summit and there's plenty of those to go around. But the lower mountain is uh, very treacherous and it's a crazy place. All right. Uh, well, we appreciate you stopping by. Does anybody have any any further questions for him? Last question. All right. And it's quick. It's I don't want you to plug anything. I want you for I would get, I'm just curious for my own sake. What's the best thermos? Best thermos. Good question. Um. <laughs> Best thermos. I'm trying to think of the Stanley. Stanley. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That my thermos. My thermos on Antarctica was a Stanley, um, and I filled that thing up every single day, and it was amazing. I actually added. I added a little bit of foam, glued some foam to the outside of it because the outside metal. If I touched metal when it was that cold, it would frostbite me. But normally, mm-hmm. you won't be in that situation with Stanley, so no, I no accessories never be needed. In that situation. <laughs> <laughs> Those, dude, I would be in Antarctica minus 40. I put hot water at the beginning of the day. 24 hours later, the thing was still piping hot. So uh, th- I'm not sponsored by Stanley, but a shout out That's to Stanley. That's ridiculous that you're not sponsored by Stanley. <laughs> a testimony like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to try to make that happen. Yeah, I was exactly. just curious because it's like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about doing this uh, Ever, ever is equivalent thing, man. I just text my shorty. She I says love it. Into- Great. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna holla at you, man. I'm please gonna do. come and bring my Stanley thermos. All right. You don't I'll, even need a thermos. There- <laughs> we we bring aid stations or water for you, so you don't have to bring a thermos. But you know, you can bring it if you want. <laughs> were you were you melting snow Bet. for water? Melting snow for water. Huh. Some people are like, "Yo, thousand pounds of water must have been real heavy, man." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just you're surrounded by water, but you just gotta melt it. You have to have white gas so you can melt the the snow into water. And never eat snow. Right. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't do you any good. It it, it uh, dehydrates you because your yeah. body has to work too hard to cool it or warm it up. And the poop situation was just like poop played as it lies. Just I wherever would, you are when you got to go. There's I, a trail of poop across. Antarctica. Well, there is a trail of poop across Antarctica, <laughs> except for when you get within 69 miles of the pole, which is the last degree of latitude uh, near that scientific research base. Antarctica regulations say you can't uh, poop and leave it out there. So for a 120 miles, because both sides of the pole, <laughs> I actually my sled was getting heavier and heavier because I was just having to carry frozen. <laughs> frozen poop you were getting lighter, and lighter i was though. getting lighter but that <laughs> yeah. sled was getting heavier but then did you um, empty yeah. the poop bag out on the, after you on got the, outside one, the radius? one foot outside the radius yeah. <laughs> obviously <laughs> how bad is the how bad is the poop on everest um you know it's gotten better over the years but unfortunately um it is not as clean of a place as you'd love it to be but it has I, honestly it has improved in the last 10 years or so years yeah. ago because there's been some focus on that so um yeah well great hanging out with you guys yeah. and i appreciate you guys having me thanks here. for calling thanks for coming in again your name's colin o'brady and if you're looking for the book it's colin o'brady the 12 hour walk invest one day conquer your mind and unlock your best life it's in stores now yep it sounds fascinating and sign up for What's the name of the day? 12 hour walk day on September 10th. If you're looking for a day to do it, but 12 hourwalk.com, come sign up any day. A- anyone, you guys are going to, you're going to do 29 or 29, my man, but uh, anyone doing the 12 hour walk, you know, who's in? What day, of the, week, what day of the week is that? That's a Saturday. Well, I, uh, I it's college, football. Week. Uh, college football. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> honestly, what we do on weekends is way harder than you walking across the <laughs> I mean, we watch college football. This is no joke. 11 a.m. Until usually about two. I mean, how many beers do you drink in that period of time? Uh, actually, it's harder not drinking beers, so we have to do it on like live stream. <laughs> Sometimes I'll drink, but um, we, so it's about let's see, it's called fourteen hours of college football on Saturday. Yeah, and then we More go from one p.m. until about one a.m. watching NFL football on Sunday. Very little break in between then. And then we stay up until like three o'clock recording a podcast afterwards. So that's like. So I'd say Tuesday is a good day for you guys to do it right after that. You know, you're unwind a little detox, get out there for the walk. Yeah, but then Monday night football and probably up until like Uh, 1 a.m. that night. So I said Tuesday, man. I'm a maybe. I'm looking at the week two schedule right now. That's Alabama, Texas. Uh, No, no, no. Tennessee Pitt. There's there's some good games this day. Well, you know what? I might might actually take you up on this. I, I, I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, it sounds like a challenge, which is maybe not on the 10th for me. Perfect. Maybe yeah, don't day. do the 10th. You can do it any day. Sign up any day, you know, the winter, or, you know, in the off season. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming out. I'm going to introduce you to Big Cat if he's here because we were talking about the 20, what is it called? 29029. Yeah. Is that how you say it? Yeah. We were talking about that last week. So I want him to meet you Amazing. while you're here. But thank you for coming in, man. Yeah, my pleasure. It. Okay. That was a fascinating interview. I want to talk more to that guy. Probably could talk for like two hours. Very well spoken, intelligent dude. 
Um, look forward to getting with him in the future. Hopefully we can have something uh, planned for uh, for meeting up with him to do some actual adventures, things like that. We'll have tell you what, macrodosing live show at the peak of Mount Everest. <laughs> I, I'm straight. I think I think I want to do that Utah shit he was talking about for real, for real. Like, I think I want to try that shit where they do the, with the, the Everest equivalent. equivalent. Yeah. If you he said there was one in Vermont, you could come over here to East Coast and do it in Vermont. We could go. We we could go like cheer you on. We all agree that yeah, we could definitely. Yeah, you ain't do try that. to do it, Billy. You want I'll, Billy? Yeah, I'll, you want do, do it I'll do it. I'll do 100. Yeah. You do it. Let's do it, Billy. Yeah. It's Don't take my shirt. You, you can bring. You, you, you can bring a little side piece, man. Word. <laughs> love that. I love that for us. <laughs> Thirty-six hours of climb. I mean, you definitely. It takes some training, but you gotta do it. Billy, you got any more yak facts you want to unleash on us here? Yaks or Yetis? Yetis. Uh, the the, Nep- the Nap- Nepalese were never uh, conquered by the British Empire. Okay. They fucked them up, but in Not resistance. Yeah. So they are the old. They're the oldest sovereign country in uh, East Asia. Okay. It's pretty sick. Uh, but Yetis, um, I kind of sick. think Yetis live in a series of uh, underground caves yeah that what's a also, group of yetis called i don't know a yodel a yet yeti <laughs> oh i like the yodel a yodel of yetis. i like a yodel i also think bigfoot and sasquatch live in a bunch of underground tunnels underneath the national parks and that's why teddy roosevelt uh distinguished those places as national parks to protect the sasquatch what's a group of what's a group of sasquatches called you miss an opportunity to coin these terms. Arian. Sasquai. Arian, a group of yetis huh. is called a flurry. A flurry. Oh. Makes I sense. like yodel better. I like a yodel. A flurry is too easy. I feel like that's low-hanging fruit, though. Yeah. Hmm. What about Sasquatch, Billy? S- Sasquai. No, but it's got to be like, you know, you just oh, make a murder of crows. crows. Okay, you want to go yeah, like that way. of zebras. So. <laughs> that's Sasquai. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, this might be low hanging fruit. How about a jerky? I was oh, oh that's good. I was thinking an orgy. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's an orgy One of Sasquatch. Man's jerky is another man's orgy. All right. Uh, anything else about Everest? Big T. Any Everest talk you want to you want to throw at us? I don't think so. Okay. I'm not climbing it anytime soon. They should build a football stadium somewhere on Mount Everest. Just to see how far you could throw a pass. True. I I said wouldn't throw a football off of the top of Mount Everest. Yeah, how far do you think Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen could throw a football off the top of Mount Everest? Well would it go f- no, would it go No, what's the physics? Yeah. It was the physics yeah, behind that. It would since it would go way downhill. Right. Like how far away from the peak would it land? It would be the longest pass of all time. For sure. But would the and and the altitude would have something to do with it too. Like the altitude would carry it, because oh. isn't it like in Denver? It yeah, yeah. Like so the air would be super thin. Right. So it'd go like way far. I think if you just like put them there, if they were to teleport to the top of Mount Everest, so they're not exhausted from climbing, it's just them up there. Right. They've got good footing, clean pocket. I think they could drop clean back. Pocket. I think Josh Allen could throw a ball. 600 yards 600 wait 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 wait. you think you're throwing it from the top of mount everest and it's landing like on the ground or this is just how far they could throw it at that altitude no if there was a hypothetical i'm not i'm not imagining like a plain football field you're imagining just down i'm not including the down okay so So it's going thirty thousand feet down to the ground no 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 i mean like where it lands if you were to take a string where it lands and then trace that string back so it's on the same ground level no. No. That's no. including altitude. I'm saying, drop. yeah. Have you ever seen like a, a I, golf I, a hole? Physics. A have physics. You, have you seen a golf yes. shot where it's an extremely that's, elevated tee? Yes, that's what I'm asking. So yeah. it's going 30,000 feet down. Yeah. Then it's going to be miles. No, but it's going to hit. But we're not it's counting hit the side of the mountain before it, yeah. it hits the and we're not, sea level. We're not counting the down feet as as accumulated. I understand that. Just purely distance where it hits the ground, how far. Um, Yard. Longitudinally, is that the right word? Latitude. No, it'd be latitudinally. Latitude, latitude, latitude longitude, long. But you know what I'm saying. Actually, you know what? The ball would eventually start just dropping from the sky, like straight down. It'd just be so, gravity. So I'm probably I'm gonna dial mine back and say they could throw it 
250 yards. I was going to say 200. 200 to 250 yards. That's my new goal. That's still a lot. Somebody should throw a football off the top of Mount Everest. And also like... Billy, you have to do that. So you no, get, that's that's what I was saying. You get I the record do. for the longest pass. I looked time. it up. Someone brought a Nerf football up there and already did it. That oh. motherfucker. How far did it go? He, well, he tore his groin doing it. And it was a serious <laughs> thing. Imagine if you... Oh, yeah. You, if got you, could, big down. you could climb down and you died because you threw a football off the top. That's fucked up. <laughs> yeah. How far did he go? Did they say? Uh, he said that he hurt himself throwing the Nerf football, but someone also hit a golf ball on the top of Mount Everest. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, if you were rich. The longer shadow about that. Yeah. What before. if? Yeah. You, there'd be a lot of pressure to like connect cleanly. Yeah. Right. Everest. The intrepid 10 handicapper used the club to strike three golf balls from the summit of Ever Mount Everest, the world's tallest peak. Someone did a golf shop off the top of Kilimanjaro. You say if you were rich, the last place I would go if I was rich is Mount Everest. To the peak. Well, I think if you get rich enough, rich people get bored. You think that would be on your list, though? I think some rich people, they have that where like... Ask Ar Arian. There you go. Life is so easy for uh, him. I don't, fuck with, I don't fuck with nature. Crazy shit I'll do is I'll... I'm probably like, I'll just get some really good wine and just light up. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's like do really good wine though. Let's do some voicemails. How's that sound? And next week, can we promo it, Maddie? Oh, or the, the macro dose, or na nano, nano dose. Yeah, on Wednesday or it'll come out Thursday. We're gonna start. What's the beef? And so in the macro dosing Discord, it's if you want to join the Discord, it's our pinned tweet on Twitter. Um, and we're gonna start. What's the beef? Uh, starting this week. So, what is beef, what's the beef? If you have a beef with any of us, if, with right? any oh, of I cannot wait. Yeah, you can go into the what's right now. They're just sending steak pictures in it, but um, <laughs> it's coming. So it'll be. Well, we record Wednesdays. So coming on Wednesday, if you have beef with us, we'll throw it in and we'll say, hey, we're about to do what's the beef. Who wants to hop on and, and beef with we'll us? Pick the, we'll pick the best one. Be ready to to if you have a mic or just you know close with the audio, we can hear you. And you have an opportunity if you got problems with anybody, just talk about it. Let's talk it out. Yeah, it's gonna go great. So let's beef. It's gonna go great. But yeah, so that's starting this week. And just while we're doing housekeeping, the shirts that sponsored Billy... by Beyond Beyond Meat. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, <it's> <laughs> um, and the shirts that Billy was referring to earlier, which him and PFT are wearing, come out on. August 10th. So they're not out right now, but they will be out. Next uh, week. Yeah. Can I get some? Yep. I'm. They're on their way. Yep. Okay. Bit, bit, bit. Just check your yep. P.O. box that you yeah. never check. I, I, yeah. No, you know what? My shorty right here, she checks the mail every fucking day. There we go. It's That's huge. Insane. So she just moved in. <laughs> Sorry, checking the mail. <laughs> I'm not checking that shit. So she going to bring that shit back. Yeah. There you go. She, but while we're doing out. housekeeping, it'll be up next week. So Billy jumped the gun a little bit, but we're happy that he is so excited. Trying to hype him up. Yeah. So get excited. But okay. Ready for voicemails? Mm hmm yeah. Do it. Hey, Matt Rudosa. It's Noah from Boston. Uh, love all of you. I just want to comment on Big T Holland, Roma, Bad Sports Town, and being unimpressed with the Coliseum. If you say just a brisk walk from the Coliseum, you'll end up at what's called the Circus Maxima which did indeed hold 150,000 people. And they did all of the Ludi, which is the Roman games for, uh, which included fighting animals, flooding for naval battles, um, gladiator events, track, horse racing, all of that shit. So they absolutely would have had the biggest stadium in the SEC. But my question is, if the podcast had to do a gladiatorial round robin, who would win? I'm mostly asking just to hear Billy try to explain why he would be there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, straight up. Let's talk about it. I'd, I'd be the first to go, obviously. <laughs> Maybe not, though. Oh, on the contrary. I would so Maddie, Billy would there's lose no Maddie Maddie. Slander. When he says Nobody would be Slander. afraid of Mad Dog. Is this with weapons or just like hand-to-hand -hand combat? You would 100% be the dude with the net. What does that uh, mean? Do you know the different what? types of gladiators? This is a very figured, specific figured, insult that Billy has. No, it's I not him for the. Uh, I figured him for the the ball uh, on a chain. Yeah, that yeah. Swings. I figured him. Oh, that would rock. Guys. Oh no, no, but I know exactly the guy that. Like you guys know the guy in Gladiator. I think he has the net. We clearly do not. 
man. <laughs> but that would absolutely be you. I think we're talking hand. Would it be hand to hand? No. We, if, we, it's, if it's hand to hand, it's, it's, it's just it is what it is. <laughs> It's Wait, big, big T is giving you a discerning look. Wait, right now. Well, the thing is, the, actually, have big T. no. The first thing we'd have to do is Arian Foster versus a wolf. I mean, oh, that's also true. Yeah, listen, all right. I get because that tweet was so viral. I get at least three or four wolf pics a day on various <laughs> social media accounts. And I tell you, it's a spectrum. It's like I always tell people: there are some wolves where it's like, dog, that motherfucker is a beast. And then they send me some wolves where it's like, bro, I'm choking you the fuck out. And so it depends on the wolf you send me. I think there's some wolves that, without a doubt, you could defeat easily. No question. Hand yeah, no I question. mean, you might get bit. You might you, you come out a little worse for the wear, but you wouldn't yeah. die. Exactly. Uh, Avery against, I think Avery would low-key kick my ass. He's a hockey player. No way. He's he's mm, better with oh, weapons I like sticks. that shit. Yeah, you tough and shit. Yeah, no, hockey players missing. Yeah, I wonder what Big T would do. Big T would be the guy with the net and the trident, a hundred percent. Yeah, wait. So what's our what's our use of weaponry available? Uh, well, there's five types of gladiators. Uh, you all have to Google them right now and select which guy. one you would be. I'm a sword guy. I think I'd just be a straight up. I think we should all have the same weapons. No, yeah. no, no. We, we have to choose what type of. Oh, a little communism in you, huh? That's not <laughs> communism. <laughs> Obviously. Wait, were there female gladiators? <laughs> I'm sure there were. Yeah. No, no, that's fan fiction. Oh. I'll take the spear. You all have a background. <laughs> With a spear, I think I'd have a chance against anybody. Because uh, yeah. if, if I threw it well, like I could hit you. And like I, I could potentially kill Billy right off the bat with a good spear throw. Okay, yeah. so Only these. Yeah, but then you if you miss, you're just standing there. Yeah, so then you're standing I, there. <laughs> so these are the six type of gladiators. There's a Trax, which is a guy with a weird shield and a sword. There's a Hoplomachus, which is a guy with a spear and a smaller shield, which also looks like it has a blade. There's the Mermillo, which looks like a classic Roman. A square shield with a Roman sword. There's a Retarius, which I think Big T would be, which is a guy with a um, trident, trident and a net. And then there's a Scissor, who's a dude who looks real creepy and has a sword and a weird, what looks like an axe hand. Like literally, he looks like he doesn't have an arm and he just has this little axe thing. And then there's a Secutor, which I would like to be, which is another guy. I, I don't understand the difference between the Secutor and the Mermillo. I think it's just their helmets, but that's another classic shield sword guy. The Mermillo has like the the has shin horns. guard like Derek Jeter. I like that. Se the sec <laughs> I'm well, team they, Mermillo. They all have shin guards. No, but, the, but you, Mermillo man. just has one on his left shin. I'm looking at this Retarius and at first I'm like, what the fuck do you have a net? But let's say you swing a sword and you that shit's strong enough to withhold a, uh, a cut. Yeah. You rendering the sword obsolete or the spear. Yeah. And I mean, then you just, that's, it's pretty interesting. If you get tangled up in a net. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Actually, the Retarius might be the way to go. I think so, man. I think I'm Retarius now. I like yeah. the, uh, the Laquarius. Laquarius has, has a, a lasso. Wait, where are you seeing Laquarius? I'm on a Wait, different. I'm on a different one. Than I want to see Laquarius. Oh, I'm just. I'm just looking at. What Billy, I thought there was only six Billy. Did you I. Lie? I looked. It said. I didn't. I did worked with what I was given. The Laquarius has oh, a many. noose and a trident, so he's got a lasso. Can you send that send, send, send that to the group, man. What, what, well, what, actually, no. the thing is, I there's even is there even more? The weakest has, has to, to be, be scissor, six. right? Oh no, some of these are from video games, guys, and they're fake classes. <laughs> so we're looking for the OG. How many different gladiators? How many types of different gladiators? These guys are really cool. I think there are five to eight different types of gladiators, but I think I think Avery would defeat me if it was me and him matched up. I think that I think Arian would just absolutely humiliate and destroy Billy. He would be humiliated before he died. But like, you're doing like one on ones. It's every, it's one V no, one said, V one. Is it no, Robin? No, he said, he round, said round Robin. Oh. Which I guess would be tough to do because in a round robin every play everyone yeah. plays everyone. Yeah, that's that's impossible. Lose twice. You die. <laughs> yeah. Twice. So let's just say let's, <laughs> if, we're, if we're doing first round matchups, <laughs> big T against Mad Dog. Shit. <laughs> what what do you think you'd be most likely to kill Big T with? 
like a weapon wise yeah you've thought about this <laughs> no, I, <laughs> wanna, you know i've never thought about how to kill you um like in those okay. days the woman's weapon was poison wasn't it yeah mm -hmm. uh i think a spear tell cersei i want her to know it was me <laughs> i think Thanks. i would do a spear just from a distance angle because i feel like if if big t also has a weapon but i have a spear i have a better chance of being farther away from him and doing that oh shit because i don't think i'm strong enough to corral him in with a net you're not i, I yeah so i think a spear or i think you need to go for big big t's legs like yeah. you need to my initial think my initial thought is the legs i think you just uh i think you're overthinking it man you gotta you gotta out hustle him i think you can get him tired enough to raise well, you his but why eat. well if you run around in just circles, like chase yeah, yeah, why would he chase me? Like, he would have to learn. Like, he, I think Big T would Big, realize he has the size over me. So he could be like, I'm just going to wait for didn't her to get they, tired. If, if they weren't fighting this shit, didn't they, like, put, like, lions or something on Oh, on they chains? had them both executed if they didn't. If, well, yeah. usually the gladiators were always, always down to bang. But if, like, the two Christians that they put in there and were like, you guys got to kill, kill each other, then they wouldn't. And then they'd be like, okay, really, like either you kill each other or we release lions to kill both of you. Yeah, I think I would have to go with a spear to kill big, with, actually to kill any of you because I think you would all kill me. But um, I think I would have to go with the spear and then hope that I would be able to throw it accurately enough to do some at least oh, damage to you. Honestly, no, there was archers. Oh, shut up. There was definitely I'm good at archers. archers. Shut up because mm. I'm good at archers. Okay, Done. yeah, no, dude, you, you got, yeah. I could do Mad a dog arrow. with a bone arrow could fuck all of us up. I'd Katniss Everdeen the shit out of all of you. Okay, when yeah. was the last time you used a bow and arrow? Um, sophomore year of high school gym class. Thank you, though. So mm -hmm. that was like 2014. Muscle memory. Yeah. Still. When was the last time you used a giant net and a trident? <laughs> yeah. I didn't say I would use that. Billy did. Okay, then what, when was the last time you used a spear? Like, this is... I, I could I could figure out how to use a bow and arrow quicker. I've yeah, done it you, before. Honestly, the person that gets bow and arrow has... An advantage. We could Take all get advantage. bow and arrow. And you have multiple. Okay. I'm assuming you also have yeah. multiple bows. Arrows. Because, or arrows. Yeah. Because there's a bow and arrow in play, I got to get one of these cats with this sh with the shield. Yeah, that's why I go. Oh, is, do you have an axe? Did you just get an axe? No, I've been, I've been playing this the whole time. We just kind of coincidentally talking about this, but I got this from <laughs> Medieval Times. <laughs> my, my, daughter, like, wait. My, da my daughter made me buy it. It lights up. It's pretty cool. I want to get a battle axe. That is cool. I really want a battle axe. All right, so Mad Dog wins. Yeah, yeah, we're all smoked. Yeah, I would, I would, Katniss Everdeen, you guys, you'd just be like little mm. Peter Malarks. Next eating, voicemail. Eating bread. Uh. <laughs> Hiding in mud. Yeah. Spoiler, sorry. It's not a spoiler. Nah, it's, it's a movie get out. Uh, this is Dan from Boston. Uh, I hope Mad Dog and Arian stay beautiful, and the rest of you guys stay handsome. Uh, I, I had a dilemma for uh, the podcast. It's 8, you walk in, first day of your new job, 8.30, you walk in, ready to go. Do some pre-work, talk to your boss, and all of a sudden, you get the shits. But you're not too sure about the shits. It's one of those uh, shits where you can shit right away and have it over, or not shit and fart a lot. But at the same time, you do you do not want to blow up the company bathroom on your first day. And you don't want to be known as the guy that farts everywhere. So just a little dilemma, kind of like a little Schrodinger's box for you guys on this fine macrodose on Tuesday. Got, got, got to go to the bathroom, man. Yeah, dude. Yeah, what who was the, the question? Who, yeah. <laughs> Like shit you, your pants? <laughs> no, no, he was like, do you, no, no, do you no, no, no. Not He's... poop and fart all day, or do you poop and have the chance I'm of gonna, blowing up the bathroom? I'm gonna go at some certain better. people. I think the softest shit ever is people who only use their bathroom in their house. I used to have. There's people who like won't use the bathroom at school in a public place. No, anywhere. they say that they're. Th if you have to shit, you have to. Like I remember, there was kids and like. I'm not scared I, to use a bathroom. That is what it was made for. Yeah, I, I absolutely I will avoid using the bathroom in public places at all costs, um, unless it's like I can't hold it. That's bathroom. what I'm like, saying. Like I'm, I'm sure you try to, but like oh, I will, I will do everything in my power not to shit. Like, but like, let's say it's like like a stadium 
or like a public event like that, I will not. I will hold my shit. I do. I don't care what happens. So no. when you got to go, you got to go though. Yeah, I'll be no. I, I, I'm I'll leave. I would rather leave than shit and be uncomfortable. And it's just the ickiest and grossest feeling. I can't do Wait, it. Wait, because because you don't feel clean afterwards? No, that it in the smell. Wow, like have you ever been in a bathroom that's like the toilets are all clogged up and everything yeah. smells like piss and shit? It's like I'm not shitting in there, bro. Would I'm not doing it. Have you ever well the thing, dude wipes always there's they actually have some nice um wallet size um wipes that you can use for when you need to clean up to feel fresh after getting out of the bathroom. Uh but besides because that I'm not going to other stalls to clean those stalls to make sure I don't smell it while I'm doing my thing. I can't I'll leave. Oh, you can't even you can't even Using a bathroom that smells bad, you can't even do that. I can't stomach it. Like I, 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 I mean, there's a spectrum, but I. But can't, your own, like, but you, but you act like your shit don't stink. Not to me, it don't like that. <laughs> what? I just saw mean? an opportunity to use that cliche, but oh. it's like shitting's always going to smell bad, so everything else. Not bad, like, not like there are times I would defecate, and I'm like, man, it's not. That's not the the best smell in the world, but it's mine, and it's not like I know it's coming from me. It's like it's relatively like normal yeah there's a but reason when it comes from another human that's disgusting yeah there's a reason for that too it's because it's it's evolution right right billy i have no idea about <laughs> you can get you can get sick if you're around other people's shit oh yeah that's probably it. but you won't get more mm. sick from your own well you have to get sick from your own shit if you eat your own shit yeah if you eat it <laughs> but i don't know yeah you're probably right i'm probably manner. probably way off on that one yeah dude yeah, i don't know those signs but i would just poop like a normal person yeah just go poop get it over with because mm -hmm. everybody's poop smells because you feel more uncomfortable like holding in a big poop yeah yeah and then you feel better the whole day it's like it is. and you could be the new guy it is what it is bro break the ice that way and also if, and if you're farting all day like who knows nah, that's definitely yeah it's definitely not it also there is the like i will though use a certain bathroom yeah that's not offensive to other people especially here yeah, like I, I won't use the pee bathroom. Like there's just no. unwritten pee and poop bathrooms. Yeah. yeah. And people know it. Yeah. 100%. Oh, did I tell you what I'm doing? In my house, I am installing downstairs a urinal. Yes. Oh, that, that is, rocks. That's so. sick. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> that's Pretty so dope. cool. <laughs> Why do you think that's cool? That's like the ultimate rich guy move. Like, hey, I'm just going to put a urinal it makes, in here. It makes so much sense because it's like I pee the majority of the time. But like I, I wouldn't like to have to clean up my you know stuff around the rim of the toilet so my shorty don't either so it's like just have my own little thing right by the toilet yep and it can have one of those little pads underneath that when you when you pee on it it smells good so it's, it's a win-win why have they decided why haven't they designed a girl a girl here yep, for women uh do we want to talk about just like the anatomy there's definitely <laughs> a way to do it It'd just be a floor or thing. It's yeah, just yeah, a floor with a drain. Yeah, it would just it would those be like urinals rock though, the ones that go all the way down to the floor. They do. I agree. Yeah. No, it would just be like peeing over a hole, Billy. Like how yeah. you pee in the shower. Because otherwise the onus is on them with the aim and it's not as precise. Aim. Well you you just can't aim. Yeah, I mean I don't I wouldn't know. Look, I was thing, looking for but... solutions. Um No, I don't hate it. I like, think, there's got to be a way. I think what you're talking about is actually just a shower. Yeah. On Wednesday, let's rank urinals. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I'm prepared. Were, was that out in Arizona where you saw the the soccer ball urinal? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah did, that was a good did one. Did we talk about troughs on this show? Did we? Have well, we done I think that we before? talked with John Taffer about it a little bit. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we did. What are your is thoughts on the, troughs? The, the, long, the, long, the long metal one? Yeah. They have a, they yeah, have we a time and about place. That Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah, we'll talk urinals. Okay, I like that. Okay. Put that in a notes notes file there, Big T, so we don't forget. All right, it'll be in my teed off notes page. All right. Yeah. You don't like troughs? Me? You'll you have to wait. Yeah. You'll have to wait until Thursday to find out. His take. I just gotcha. said. I just said they have a time and place. Got you. Like, like Neyland Stadium would feel wrong if they got rid of the troughs. Man, it's been so long. I don't even remember peeing in there. Well, you also were, weren't peeing like where Big T was peeing. Those are facts. I like ice. All right, we'll save this. Okay. Yeah. Ice, ice is ice is good, man. Yeah. Cools, cools drinks. Are you gonna put? Are you gonna wait? Put wait, we're giving it all away now. <laughs> you have to wait. 
Let's do the next voicemail. Okay, last one. Hello, guys. Scott from Nashville. Uh, listening to, I think it was the beginning of the Sharks episode, talking about Casey Anthony, some of those kind of high-profile cases, got me wondering. There was one unsolved case out there that you guys could get answers to. Which one would it oh, be? It could be geez. unsolved murder, bank heist, whatever. Doesn't matter the crime, just has to be unsolved. Which one would you guys get answers to? Big T, chop on, brother. Everyone else, stay handsome, stay gorgeous, all that. Thanks. Bye. I I have a question what? slash I want to potentially make an amendment to his voicemail. I don't know of like any unsolved cases necessarily that I would like want to know, but I know of cases that like I would want to know if someone was actually guilty or not. Right. So I think, can we do that? That counts. So I could say Kennedy, the Kennedy assassination. Right. It's been solved, but I want to know the details behind it. Right. And know exactly what really happened. Hmm. Yeah, like what actually happened. Yeah. I got OJ. Three. I was just say that's the obvious well, one. Yeah, OJ. I, I got I got three obvious ones. I got I need to know what happened with MLK. I need to know who killed uh, uh Malcolm X, and I need to know who killed Tupac. Mm, Tupac. Mm -hmm. Although we're pretty sure who killed Tupac it was Orlando Brown, but I just want to make sure. You know what I mean? If you had to rank those, which one's number one? Malcolm X. Why why Tupac and not Biggie? Uh I grew up loving Pac. I was well, anti Biggie okay. until I was like fifteen. Cause Pac didn't like him, so I didn't like him. That was just the Coast Wars back then. Billy, you yeah. was too young for that. I would Where say, were you on the Coast Wars, uh PFT? Where was I on the Coast Wars? Well, I was not like I'm saying what side did you side on or, or did you take part in it? Was that two Americas? I it was it might have been two Americas. So I was aware of Damn. The, I was aware of the Coast Wars going on, but I was also like eleven at the time. I mean I was twelve. So. Yeah. I mean I wasn't as in tune with it as you were. I, I would say if I look back on it, I think I prefer Biggie to Tupac. But like right. with the war going on between I, I can't actually take a side because I don't I don't know that much about it. I mean, you know, now I'm an adult and they're both great artists. But like back then, like like for instance, I didn't listen to a Jay Z song until 2009 because of that shit. Oh wow! You, I just you like, held out I, longer I, I, than most. <laughs> yeah, <thanks. laughs> well, but but by that time, my musical taste developed already, so I just wasn't interested. And then my man's was like, "Yo, you, uh, what's your favorite Hove joint?" We got to talking about Hove, and I was like, "I don't really fuck with him like that." He's like, "What the fuck do you mean?" I was like, "I just never really listened to him like." I was, I was like, I, I like Pac, I like Snoop, I liked all these cats. And then uh, uh, he was like, yo, throw this on. And so he played The Evils uh, on Reasonable Doubt. Brilliant, fucking brilliant from a 26 year old. And so I had to double back on his whole catalog. And now I think he's the greatest rapper that has lived. That's growth. It is, man. Yeah. It's recognizing you were wrong. It's opening your mind. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I can't pick a side. I, I like, I was listening to um, 10 Crack Commandments. A couple mm, days ago, solid. solid. It's it's favorites. really good. Like if you just yeah. listen to the wordplay that he has and and the flow that mm -hmm. Biggie does, it's um. And I'm describing maybe the whitest way possible, but it's just like objectively, no, it's, just, it's objectively solid. well written and like really fantastic music. Great production, everything. It's fantastic song, flawless song. Yep. We got anything else? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Scotty P. That's mine. <laughs> yeah, Scotty P. <laughs> Scott, Scott Peterson. Oh, yeah. oh. Well, you could say like, OJ too. Like, <laughs> OJ, technically, Nicole Brown and yeah, Ronald Nicole Goldman's murders, murders are unsolved, unsolved, right? Yeah. We don't know. No, you still don't know. It's just on. File's still open. Allegedly. That and um, I would like to know more specifics of what happened with the Gabby Petito case. It was Brian Laundry? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, but it came out. Did you see that it came out last week that he basically wrote like a suicide note being like, she fell, hit her head on a rock, and was like bleeding out. And he killed her to like she asked him to like put her out of her misery. That's just not true. That's right. not true. But yeah. I would like to know like what the details behind that were. Yeah, like, more like he, he hit her in the he, back of the head. The detail. With the, rock. the details are that's cap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dude, I mean, the guy blew his brains out. <laughs> right. I th and I so think now he's like, I can't. I can't live with like I. I dealt with things wrong, and I can't live with 
you know, whatever. Dude, they were, the, they were fighting the whole way. Right. On the road. I think what happened was uh, he killed her. that exact story that he wrote, except minus the part where she fell. Yeah. I think that's Also, it. he was he quoted a book about a guy who killed a girl out in the woods, and he was like an eco- f- Eco-fascist? E- no, no, eco-terrorist. I don't think it was eco-fascist. Yeah, but I would I would like to know the details of what actually happened. Give me the full details of the Epstein case. Yeah. yeah. It's a good one. That's it. I mean, what are the names? Just I, w- I want to see that. I want to see that book. Mm. Show me the names. I would, too. I All think right. that would actually cause, like, if those got released, it might tear the fabric of society. Yeah, hundred percent. I want the I want the files to be released on all the Michael Jackson. Uh, I was gonna say, I'm surprised you didn't say that. I was I just, just about for, to I say just that. Forgot. He said cold cases on. Um, yeah. I'm not even worried about how he died. I'm pretty sure how you know what I'm talking about. Just all the cases, just so we can clear his name, because a lot of those files are still locked up. That can clear a lot of the accusations up. LA County has them, or not LA, um, fuck is it, uh, Santa Barbara? Yeah, maybe that's it, Santa Barbara. Okay. Oh, you know what's fascinating? When Bill, this is kind of related, but when Bill Russell, uh, Bill, oh, RP. Yeah, we, RIP. Did we talk we about it? Talk about it. Yeah. Damn, RP to Bill Russell, man. Legend, dog. On this, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. On the same sort of discussion, like he got his FBI file on himself. Like, that's wild. Yeah. And it, it like discussed him, you know, like a very bad way. And like all the stuff that he went through. Just, I read a, a tweet about some of the stuff he went through, like, you know, people doing terrible things to his house while he was away vandalizing. And then like FBI had a file on him that he was able to get through the Freedom of Information Act. Arian, you might have a file. No question. Most black activists have an FBI file. I know my sister does for sure. I know my dad does. But if you have any kind of act- activism and if you made any kind of noise, like they got a file on you. They've opened investigations. For sure. Wow. Um, but yeah. I got a file. No, you, you don't. <laughs> Could. You definitely. Well, I can see the CIA having a file on you. You've made uh, a number of pro Saudi Arabia comments. Yeah. Now nah, they probably monitoring his internet because he <laughs> he casts a wide web of what he looks up. I'm pretty sure. Okay. You've you've but hit I think this podcast. I think this podcast is the tip of the iceberg of what Billy be searching on. Yes. You got a private <laughs> server, bro? You got a no? No. What they call this? I no. Uh, 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 I I the farthest I've gone is 4chan. I've <laughs> see that you in one time the up. Silk Road it's furthest furthest furthest, furthest sorry you've gone. Yeah. FBI has a file on Big T. Probably. I hate speaking <laughs> truth to power. <laughs> they do. All right. Well, we will see you guys on Thursday for urinal talk. And what's the beef? <laughs> and what's the beef? What's... So, Maddie, what's the best way for them to... If you have beef, how does Maddie find out about the beef? So, go to the Macro Design Discord. Join, join the Discord. Join the What's the Beef channel. And drop it in there. All go on when we're recording and be like yo let us know what the beef is and then you should let you should let them know what time to be on so that they can be available okay say perfect. wednesday at 1 1 p.m wednesday at 1 p.m eastern standard time be on be there ready. if you have beef and avery and i will pick out who's got beef and then you'll be on the show with us this this Spon- is gonna, sponsored by beyond meat sponsored by beyond meat this is really gonna get into existence xbox chat rooms real quick yeah it's gonna be, get toxic as fuck. Well, the good thing about it is it's pre-recorded, so if it gets too crazy, we can just cut it True. or edit it. Yeah, or but, we don't. Yeah, why would we, just we? let that we shit, let fly. shit fly and give let out the fly. usernames? <laughs> this yeah, guy. let's dox them. <laughs> fuck <laughs> them. Addresses. Expose them. Yeah, if you're gonna say some, say fuck some it. fuck shit, we're exposing you. <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah, we dox here. But yeah, if you have beef, let and let us know what the beef is. But I'm not just gonna like choose a random person. So let us know what beef you have. And with who, and then we'll chit chat. Maybe we'll resolve some things. We'll work things yeah. out. Perfect. Clarify some shit. All right. Love you guys. See you next week. Whoa. Actually, no. See you Wednesday slash Thursday. <laughs>